Um, sharing knowledge is the most fundamental act of friendship because it is a way you can give something without losing something. A very hearty good morning to each and every one present over here. I am Dr. Raf Pokhril. And I'm Dr. Swati Somya. And we will be your hosts for today. Ladies and gentlemen, today I stand here with nothing but gratitude for being given this opportunity to not, to not just be in the same room with some of the best minds of the country, but also to wit witness history being made with and influence lives. We've had some wonderful sessions yesterday where you shared your knowledge and contributions. There have been times when we as interns were frustrated because we could do so little to save lives. But one such incident has brought our faith and hopes back to the field of medicine. In uh, Manipal Teaching Hospital, we had a patient with intracerebral hemorrhage and the patient was in his early 20s and there were very little chances of survival. But we have witnessed him improve day, with every passing day. And the surgery was done by none other than our very own Dr. Bal Gopal Karmacharya. So with this, I just say, doctors, it is you who inspire us to be better. We expect a similar experience today with the seminars. So let's begin with the first session of day two. This is, this is an award session for the Young Neurosurgeon Award. And may I, for this, may I call upon the moderators who are also the judges for this session, Dr. Basant Pant, Dr. Pawan Kumar Sultania, and Dr. Praveen Shrestha. <clears throat> Very good morning, everybody. So we are going to start the Young Neurosurgeon Award session. And there are three contestants in it. And I call upon Dr. Anjan Singh Karki uh, to present his work. Dr. Anjan Singh Karki, please. Good morning, respected chairperson, respected uh, delegates. I'd like to um, thank the organizing committee for providing me this opportunity to speak on this topic. My topic is uh, surgical management of intraventricular tumors. Okay, I would like to start my presentation with this uh, beautiful picture that was uh, taken in 1966. Uh, this was the surgery done by Walter Dandy. Uh, he he uh, he was removing um, the uh, intraventricular tumor uh, manually uh, through the uh, parietal transcortical approach. So, coming to the introduction part of the intraventricular tumors, they constitute less than uh, one percent of the intracranial lesions and less than around ten percent of the all the CNS tumors, and only around ten percent of these tumors are truly intraventricular. So there are different types of intraventricular tumors, colloid cysts, subependymomas, central neurocytomas, subependymal giant cell astrocytomas, choroid plexus tumors, medulloblastoma, uh, meningiomas, and other include the craniopharyngioma, astrocytomas, epidermoid, dermoid, and uh, gliomas. So these are uh, intraventricular tumor tumors are usually benign. They grow at a very slow rate, and the clinical presentation they may be incidental finding. 
while taking other images and they uh, usually uh, present with either the obstructive uh, hydrocephalus or with the uh, gross compression of the neighboring structures. The usual presentation would be headache. Uh, the most common presentation in interventricular tumors uh, is headache uh, and ataxic, ataxia is another presentation. Headache, vomiting, ataxia, uh, cognitive dysfunction, personality changes, motor uh, weakness, uh, uh, and um, another is visual disturbances. Seizure is very uh, is not that common in intraventricular tumors, but they do present with sometimes with the seizures. There are, there are reported cases of sudden death in colloid cyst, and patient if there is the significant compression, patient may present with the perinode syndrome, and that involves the rostral interstitial you know, compression of the uh, rostral interstitial nucleus of medial longitudinal fasciculus in the midbrain nucleus in the tectal plate level. And that is associated with upward gaze palsy, downward or upward uh, beat nystagmus, and also impaired convergence. We, we had a, a, a retrospective rat uh, chart review at uh, TUTH um, uh, from, uh, for one year, and patient uh, with interventricular ventricular tumor who underwent re uh, resection were included. And we had total of, uh, uh, we had, uh, Total of 33 patients, out of which two went against the two left against uh, medical advice. One went home on on his request, and the patient who underwent BP shunt and discharge, but they were lost to follow up, were seven. And the total patients who actually under underwent surgery were 23, out of which three had undergone endoscopic procedure, and uh, uh, and the 20 patients had open procedure done. So, uh, and we had 58% um, uh, of the male population and 42% uh, uh, of female population, mean uh, duration of hospital stay was 20.7%. Uh, and predominantly, these patients presented with uh, clinical, uh, uh, with the complaints of headache and vomiting. There were 25 patients out of 33 who had headache and vomiting at the time of presentation. Vision loss was presented in uh, in five uh, uh, cases and ataxia was in uh, uh, five cases uh, and there were other symptoms uh, in the uh, rest of the seven patients. The tumor type, we had a supratenterial lesion in uh, in eight patients uh, that constituted 34.8%. Infratenterial lesion was seen in six, 15 patients and medulloblastoma seen in seven patients, ependymoma five. Neurocystic sarcosis was quite high. Uh, around 13 percent of the intraventricular tumor so neurocystic sarcosis in our in our uh, center and there were other cases colloid system angioblastoma dermoid central neurocytoma pilocytic astrocytoma and colloid plexus papilloma and the outcome at the discharge was uh, uh, we had a good outcome of mrs score of 0 to 1 in 16 patients that constitute around 69.6 percent and the poor outcome was seen in 17 percent of the cases Mortality, there were, we had uh, three cases. We had mortality of three patients. So coming to the dis 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 discussion part, there are several approaches uh, to interventricular tum tumor. Selection of oper operative corridor is uh, depends on the uh, on these principles. There should be minimal retraction of the functional brain. There should be adequate adequate early exposure of vital structure, expanded working angles of gross for gross total resection, and easy access to tumor's blood supply and uh, a technical difficulty of the operative route. Uh, so this is, the, the, it is important to control the lesions vascular supply early in the discussion and, uh, and pack the rest of the ventricular system with the patties so that uh, we can avoid the uh, blood spills to rest of the ventricles. And uh, septal vein may be sacrificed, one of the central vein may be sacrificed, but we should be careful to preserve the thalamus right vein and internal cerebral veins and phonics should be uh, protected to avoid the uh, memory uh, you know, impairment. So there are several approaches. Um, uh, there are several approaches, anti-interhemispheric transcalosal approach, subfrontal trans uh, laminar term, laminar term approach, interhemispheric approach, uh, and we have a supracerebellar infratentorial approach, telovelar and transvormian approaches.
Uh, so there are several, several advantages of transcortical approach. Uh, in transcortical approach, parasitical veins are not the con concern, and we can have we can avoid the tedious interhemispheric di dissection. And but the problem with the transcortical approach is there is less flexible working angles, and projection fibers come in on the way. So there is a risk of uh, there is a theoretical risk of seizure in transcortical approaches. So uh, anterior interhemispheric very transcalosal approach is much main, mainly for the midline lesions without significant lateral extension. And we have to avoid the injury to the genome of the internal capsule that come just lateral to it. And the uh, uh, anastomosis site thalamus straight vein with internal cerebral veins. And the trans, um, sorry. Trans, uh, It's not going. Uh, so, transfrontal transcortical approach. This is mainly for the lesion in the frontal horn. Though the, they will go through the uh, middle frontal gyrus, and this is ideal for the patient with large ventricles and in the non-dominant areas. We have a posterior interhemisphere transcalosal approach, and callostomy is just done, just anterior to the splenium. And that usually that mainly exposes the posterior body of the ventricle, posterior one third of posterior third of the ventricle, and the pineal region. Another is transcortical trans uh, transparietal transcortical approach. The problem with this approach is that we can have if we are operating on the dominant side, patient can have the dyslexia, agraphia, acalculia, visual field the, the, the deficits, and finger agnosia. While on the non-dominant side also, we can have visual spatial uh, information uh, impairment and neglect and visual uh, field deficits. We can, uh, another approach is anterior temporal neocortical resection approach, where if, if the lesion is in the anterior temporal horn and then oncus, amygdala, and hippocampal lesion, we can uh, approach through this uh, approach. And we have other approaches, transylvian approach, mainly for the amygdala and hippocampal lesion, occipital neocortical resection. The problem with this uh, approach is homonymous visual field deficits. And we have transporaminal transvenous transcortical approach that is in the third ventricular lesion. Uh, other uh, lesions, uh, other approaches, subfrontal trans, uh, trans lamina, trans, uh, uh, la trans lamina terminals approach. That's also for third ventricle lesion, and we can have endoscopic trans uh, nasal trans spinoid, uh, trans lamina terminals approach. That is uh, for the third ventricle lesion with the paracellar extensions. We can approach through the trans nasal approach also. We have supracellular trans ventricular approach and occipital interhemispheric inter transtentorial approach. And, and, the, and for the fourth ventricular lesion, we usually approach through the transformin or, uh, or, or, or uh, trilovelar approach. So coming to the conclusion, uh, intraventricular tumors are rare lesion with many surgical approaches. And there are technical challenges also. It's a difficult to, sometimes difficult to reach location, deep, narrow surgical corridor. And we have got uh, the neighboring diencephalic and brainstem structures, and they're highly vascular, uh, high vascularity supplied by the corridor vessel. The problem with this is that corridor vessel sometimes may not be possible to coagulate at the beginning of the surgery, and that gives on, uh, keeps on bleeding. And uh, complex ventricular anatomy can further be complicated by the distorted anatomy um, uh, distortion due to the tumor itself. So gross total dissection of the tumor should be attempted, attempted due to mostly benign nature of these tumors and the surgical corridor should be tailored according to the size and the location of the lesion and the surgical uh, expertise. Thank you. Hello. Thank you, Anjan, for a nice presentation. Sure. You showed in your paper that the 15 cases were the intratentorial and 8 cases were the supratentorial out of the 23. So how do you justify that intratentorial tumors are more common intraventricular than the supratentorial? Do you have any... Uh, uh, yes, sir. And, uh, intraventricular tumors uh, actually... Uh, in 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 this case, I uh, included the uh, fourth ventricle tumor, the medulloblastomas, and those um, tumors on the posterior fossa with the involvement of the fourth ventricle. So, intratentorial uh, tumors were um, were more in number in in, in our 
uh, you know, study for the for one year period. The total interval in tumors mm -hmm. is really uh, how many are these pretentorial, how many of them are intertentorial. So your paper is also all right. Okay. That way, you, do you have any data for that? Uh, really, relatively, the supertentorial um, interventricular tumors um, uh, are found to be more common in most of the papers uh, compared to the infratentorial tumors. But in our study, in one year period, it was found to be infratentorial tumors were found to be more common than the supertentorial ones. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Anjan, for your nice presentation. So in your series, um, was any of your case operated by endoscopic technique? If yes, then how do you plan whether to go endoscopically or open microscopically? Uh, endoscopically, we had only three cases done, neurocyst surfaces cases. Um, there was endoscopic uh, removal of the cyst. And in the rest of the cases, we did uh, either transcortical uh, approach or uh, transcalosal approach and uh, before deciding which approach to use we just uh, based on the size of the tumor location of the tumor we just decided this but um, actually more in most of uh, we had uh, four cases of trans uh, calosal approach three endoscopic cases and rest of the cases were done through the transcortical approach and the inter interventricular leads and fourth ventricle tumors were approached with uh, midline suboccipital crank tumor with trans some Almost fifty percent with transvermin and uh, and telocular approach. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> you mentioned that uh, in a temporal lobe a tumor, uh, there is a possibility of visual loss uh, postoperatively. So, which is the uh, lesion? What kind of lesion could have a visual loss, and how can you avoid that? situation uh in the temporal area we usually if the <clears throat> if we um, uh, remain within uh, 2.5 to 3 centimeters of the anterior tip in the middle temporal gyrus then uh, possibly we can avoid the visual loss sir so don't go above huh? uh, so don't go above optic don't go radiation is, radiation is above yes, so you want to avoid above mm -hmm. you want to go from below uh, up to middle temporal gyrus. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank, thank, you, thank you, sir. Uh, yeah. Next uh, contestant of this award session is Dr. Samir Arial. Good morning. Uh, very uh, good morning to all the uh, professor in the dais, and uh, uh, the topic of my today's presentation is outcome of infertility management at the hospital. Uh, in early 1900s, it was Harvey Cushing who presented 85 cases of uh, meningeal based tumors in his Cavendish lecture, and it was him who uh, coined the term of meningioma. But years later, after uh, with uh, Louis Eisenhardt, it was um, him who uh, developed a monograph of all these kind of tumors, and he described that um, meningiomas are um, the tumors that uh, are not dural based, but they arise from uh, arachnoid capsules that are abundant in um, uh, the uh, areas around the dural sinuses. <laughs> We all know meningiomas are very common. It's uh, one of the most common tumor we encounter on day to day basis. And they are mostly benign tumors, uh, although the 2021 WHO rate has also uh, followed the 2016 grade and uh, termed the meningioma as grade one, grade two, and grade three. So it comprises around 25 to 30% of all CNS tumors that are detected. And as we so more and more people into the MRI machine, and these are all the asymptomatic meningiomas are more frequently detected these days than previously. So in many case series, uh, around 20% of uh, all meningiomas are uh, said to thought to be uh, infratentorial. Treatment modalities uh, ranges from active 
monitoring of the lesions, uh, benign asymptomatic lesions, to stereotactic radio surgery. However, surgical excision of these benign lesions have very good outcome and uh, still remains the mainstay of the treatment. Uh, my study uh, was to retrieve the ideas about the descriptive clinical pathological characteristics and outcome of surgically treating particular meningioma at uh, an NRCB hospital. <coughs> and the material and method was that it was a retrospective study. Uh, actually, this was uh, all the meningiomas operated was uh, Professor Rajib's uh, prospective study up, up until 2019, but my affiliation with the hospital starts from 2020. So I have done a retrospective study uh, from in uh, that cases lasting from January 2015 to uh, July 2022. Uh, that ranges for 91 months of uh, the study period. And the inclusion criteria were, were all consecutively operated histologically proven infratendural meningiomas and meningiomas with supertendral uh, extension like um, the temporary meningiomas were uh, excluded from this study. <sighs> Total cases were 32, that was 12% of 230 meningiomas operated during that period. period. <clears throat> and mean age was uh, 48 with standard deviation of 16.3 and uh, the age ranges from 16 to uh, 79 uh, percent. Uh, around half of the patient, uh, more than uh, two thirds of the patients were female, with free value of uh, uh, 0.05. The test was used, which is a significant uh, statistical, statistical uh, data. <clears throat> Headache. Almost all the patients uh, with uh, meningiomas uh, in my series had. Uh, some form of headache. I think that the population of our country will never deny a headache as well when asked upon. So, um, headache with eating disturbances and vertigo, vomiting, and all unsteadiness, and those sort of uh, clinical presentation were the most common one. <clears throat> clinical findings was cranial nerve deficits, uh, including sensory neural hearing loss, brain stem dysfunctions. Uh, um, um, features of raised ICP and cerebellar dysfunctions were uh, the clinical findings. <clears throat> Most common location was a CP angle for, followed by petroclagal. And we, we had uh, one unclassified cases as well. <clears throat> it was, uh, this case was, I edited the uh, previous slide, it was a purely clival meningioma. And all the histopathological outcome was trans transitional meningi uh, transitional meningiomas were the most common one, and uh, we didn't have any on the grade three. Uh, yes. Complications resulted from minor CSF leak to permanent cranial nerve deficits. Facial nerve involvement was the most common of uh, of them all, <coughs> followed by chest infection and other complications as well, and like the uh, trigeminal. Um, like the hypothesis of transgenomic uh, nerve distribution was one of the common. So we achieved a total excision in 25% uh, of uh, 25 cases, which is 79% of cases. The operational definition I've mentioned that is without any visible, visible tumor, uh, remained on surgical finding and post op scan. <laughs> So the total excision was done again the same thing, and uh, not necessarily uh, these all uh, surgical procedures were done in different patients. Patients, nutrition, and practitioners were uh, performed in, uh, in, in, in few cases, uh, and the front and practitioners uh, would have been done in, uh, in certain cases in the same patients. <laughs> Outcome is, uh, I've used modified ranking uh, score for the outcome score, and uh, um, um, but, um, up to grade three is, uh, was termed as uh, good uh, outcome. We had 28 cases on, uh, with good outcome, and then uh, unfortunately, four patients had, had a very bad outcome uh, using the G test. The uh, outcome with p value of uh, less than 0 0.05. We have a good outcome uh, rate in all the patients. <clears throat> so uh, I'd like to uh, uh, compare a few of the articles uh, that has been published in international journals. This is the clinical outcome of uh, infratentral meningioma in the developing country, published in Egypt uh, by Elkodi et al. And they have the complication rate of 55%, uh, which was very high. And um, our paper 
as a better outcome than this uh, paper. And the other one is a large series published in Korean Journal of uh, Neurosurgery by Min Ho Young et al. This is a surgical experience of infrared and and the permanent uh, complication rate was around 13% in that case. <clears throat> and uh, we have uh, uh, my, this is a national paper uh, of uh, meningiomas, but uh, uh, there was no uh, data about regarding uh, infrared how many cases were infrared one. But uh, I think it has been mentioned that 85% were uh, supratentorial, that means 17% of cases were infrared meningiomas. Uh, in my series, it was 12% of cases with infrared-tentorial meningiomas. <clears throat> there were a few cases uh, that I was involved in uh, surgical accident in the last year, uh, last year, one year, one and a half years in the hospital. And this is a petro, uh, one of the petrosome meningioma, the pre-op scan and post-op scan. Yeah. This is a petroclavial meningioma. We had uh, we have had a complete uh, surgical accident. With the patient doing the UN. Huh? Ah, sorry. Back to the computer. <laughs> In this case, uh, we, we had to do a uh, uh, subtotal resection. Uh, the uh, limit of resection was restricted by basilar artery and uh, uh, fifth nerve uh, anteriorly, and uh, the patient is doing well, but she uh, used to complain of uh, severe hypostasia of the uh, in the distribution of all cranial nerves, uh, all uh, areas of the transmural nerve. And this is uh, one of the very first cases I had. Uh, I was um, glad to be involved in uh, doing uh, the post op scan, doesn't look very good, uh, although the total excision has been achieved. <laughs> And this is uh, the most recent uh, cases we did. We have achieved uh, total excision in petroclavian meningioma. The patient is doing well. She, has, uh, she was presented with a uh, uh, lower cranial nerve palsy. So I would like to conclude that although most of the infrared meningiomas are benign histological pattern, but they, because of their uh, affinity with uh, important vascular and neurovascular structure, uh, to operate is uh, it in uh, the very challenging case. And uh, as a young neurosurgeon, started my uh, early career uh, as a micro neurosurgical surgeon, I found it very challenging uh, to operate. And I uh, almost always had uh, my senior uh, neurosurgeon involved in these cases. And the post operative complications, as you all know. And the take home message, I think I, I like to uh, mention that uh, meningiomas uh, as a whole are very uh, like uh, easy to operate, uh, like convexity meningiomas, supratentral meningiomas. But infratentral meningiomas should be put uh, as a different uh, entity when starting in your career. So, although microsurgery, you have to develop a very good microsurgical technique to you know, uh, effectively tackle this sort of thing. So I've been blessed uh, with the help of these distinguished Professor Prakash, Professor Gopal, and Professor Rajiv Raitav. I will help you with uh, more for Thank you so much for your time. Hello, Samir. <clears throat> nice presentation. You told that the more cases of the females are there. So what is the cause for that, that the females are affected more, <coughs> more affected with the meningioma rather than the uh, male? And the another is, is there any relationship between the radiation and the meningioma? Yes, sir. Uh, firstly, meningiomas are very common in female because of uh, certain theories of uh, uh, the receptor in the meningiomas that are uh, uh, that are present in female estrogen and position, but that has not been proven. Uh, so, female in their forties and uh, obesity is one uh, factor that can affect many, uh, people to have meningiomas. The other question is: yes, radiation exposure. 
uh, has been associated with meningiomas and uh, a long term radiation exposure has been in some papers uh, been associated with uh, intracranial meningiomas. Yes, sir. Progesterone and estrogen hormones. Yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you, Dr. Samir. Uh, you said uh, out of your many meningioma cases, uh, the most common location was CP angle. Is it? Yes, sir. I found that most of the cases, probably less, slightly less than half of your cases, were in CP angle meningioma. Uh, but uh, theoretically, more common ones are convexity or parasitical. Yes, sir. Uh, in, in fact, in today's meningioma, both uh, CP angle location was the most. Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, uh, how did you uh, manage the uh, possibility of bleeding during surgery? Did you do any preoperative embolization or did you do any intraoperative procedure to whenever, whenever uh, possible, we have been coordinating with uh, TUTS teaching hospital with for embolization since our patients are very poor and they can't offer a lot of uh, procedures. But still, we whenever feasible, we are trying to embolize the cases. In this, uh, in last one and a half years, we have uh, embolized a couple of cases, not in fat and real, but pineal um, meningiomas and lateral spinal meningioma. We have sent patients to TUTS for embolization from the hospital. We are doing it on a regular basis. Interoperatively, we uh, uh, follow just the microsurgical technique, the microsurgical technique, we pack uh, the systems with. Uh, our batteries need to, uh, to avoid the spillage, and that is how we have been uh, dealing with uh, bleedings. Thank you. Uh, in uh, two of your cases, uh, you were saying that these were petroclival meningioma. The first case where you could not remove the whole of the tumor, and uh, that was not a petroclival, that's a petrous. Petrus tumor, there was no clival involvement. And the second case was a petroclival meningioma where there was a total excision. So what is the, why there was no total excision in the first case and uh, there was a total excision in the difficult case? Uh, thank you for your question. So the, the second case was, uh, the tumor was very subtle and uh, it had a good plane with uh, all the neurovascular structures. And uh, once we were remove, uh, removing it, the tumor would, uh, you know, just give away with the uh, microsurgical. So tumor. my suggestion is in your further study, because you did not mention about the possible hardness yeah, I and agree. the possible fibrosis of the tumor. This is the major determining factor agree, sir, for many geomas. So we can <clears throat> at least guess. Uh, by preoperative MRI, sure. whether this tumor is a hard tumor or a soft tumor. Sure. So this has to be mentioned. Yes. And secondly, I think you should incorporate uh, ISC immunohistochemistry yes, and genetic also, uh, because uh, as uh, Professor Sultania was also asking, you know, there's a female predominance in many geoma cases. And now, if you cannot remove whole of the tumor, then you should look for progesterone receptor. And if there's a lot of progesterone receptor in the tumor, then you can give anti-progesterone, you know, chemotherapy to, you know, stop it from growing, you know. So this is my suggestion. Oh, thank you so much. Sir. Thank you, Samir. Yeah. Uh, just comments about the hydrocaphalus associated with the CP angle tumors. Uh, it's better that if there is hydrocaphalus, you should go for the preoperative uh, external third ventriculostomy before going for the main surgery. And uh, in, in that way, you can avoid many shunts as well. Secondly, if there is hydrocaphalus, in most of the cases of meningiomas, it settled automatically, postoperatively. But in cases of uh, the acoustic schwannoma, uh, you have definitely to put either, either perform a preoperative ETV or just to have room for VP shunt. So otherwise, it was a good uh, series and excellent uh, presentation. I just sense. wanted to comment about this hydrocaphalus associated with this. Thank you so much. Thank you. So the next speaker is Sandeep Bora from Kathmandu Medical College, and he's 
going to talk about the need of uh, ventilation after subarachnoid hemorrhage. Uh, surgery or after surgery? Yes. Uh, good morning, respected senior uh, chairperson, respected seniors, and our dear colleagues. Uh, I'm Dr. Sandeep Bora, and today I'll be talking about a small but yet effective, uh, uh, but yet uh, important uh, topic in the effective management of patients and in SH. Uh, so, one of the most important problems in developing uh, countries with limited number of specialized ICU beds and the ventilator, and many of these centers rely on central ICU that caters towards surgical and medical subspecialties. And there is also elective ventilation of aneurysm surgery, which is a much debated topic with some uh, centers practicing mandatory elective ventilation of surgery, while some centers going for the uh, extubation of the patient uh, based upon their pre op conditions. And typical ICU bed is done by ventilators is, reversed, uh, is reserved for those patients who are undergoing craniotomy and the uh, maximum clipping of aneurysm. And this will potentially lead to a few problems, such as the unality of ICU bed leading to delay in the surgery. Reserving base for the duration of surgery may lead to other patients, subsequent patients uh, in need to prevent them to uh, avoid the ICU bed. And similarly, this may necessarily lead to financial burden on the patients in such care is not needed. So the objective of the study was to evaluate the frequency of post-operative ventilator requirement in patient and in SS and to identify the factors that uh, influence the need for the post of ventilation in patient with and SS and evaluate the difference in functional outcome uh, between the patients who wanted post of ventilation and who did not go. So this was a post study. Uh, at uh, Department of Surgery at KNCTH over a duration of six years. Ethical approval was taken from the Institute's Ethical Committee. And all patients who underwent microsurgical clipping of endocrine aneurysm including study, and patients were intubated in the pre-op period because of low GS, GCS were excluded from the study. Similarly, presence of other neurosurgical uh, condition upon endocrine aneurysm or presence of similar episode earlier or quelling of any endocrine aneurysm earlier were also excluded from the study. And since this is a retrospective study, uh, patients who didn't have details were also excluded from the study. So all patients with diagnosed endocrine aneurysm were admitted in the high care. And the diagnosis assay was based upon the uh, positive uh, findings on the admission CT scan. And aneurysm confirmed with the BSC or CT angiography. And the plan of management were decided uh, by the attending consultant as per the department protocol. So these are different variables that we uh, recorded. This is the demography, clinical critical factors, and uh, clinical factors. And also we uh, followed the patient post with the help of MRS and GS score at uh, discharge for one month, six months, and one year post op period. The data was analyzed with the help of the SPCS version 21, an association between the various demographics, clinical radiological factors, and the operative factors, and the need for post ventilation was determined using experiments for relation test. And ROC curve was determined, it was used to determine the part of score of clinical radiological factors with area under the curve to determine the significance. And P1 less than 0.05 was considered as significant. So of the 62 patients, 17 percent were 17 patients excluded because these patients were already intubated in the pre-op period. And of the 48 patients, there were 15 male patients and 30 female patients. And the majority of patients were in the age group of uh, 51 to 60 years with all 15 patients. Uh, these are the demographic data collected. Uh, the mean age was 52.95 uh, years. And the mean GCS was 13 with the maximum GCS of 15 and a minimum of 9. And the uh, mean duration of post ventilation was 2.66 days. And the mean duration of hospital stay was 16.48 days. So, majority of patients, there are 53 patients under elective surgery, whereas 4% uh, patients under the immune surgery. And the uh, about 51% patients, they required the ventilation in the post op period, whereas in 48%, uh, in 49%, we are able to extubate the patient post op relief. And the reasons for the post op ventilation, the majority of patients, they are long distance surgery or 35% patients. And 20% patients were uh, intubated on advice of anesthesia. 13% patients are excessive bleeding during the surgery, 13% patients interrupt brain swelling, and 17% patients had uh, interrupt BP fluctuation. So these are the reasons that the patient were kept ventilated in the post op period. And uh, talking about demographic factors, we could find that none of these demographic factors had significant association with the need for the post op ventilation. Uh, we also tried to calculate the pre -op, uh, clinical condition like the pre-op GCS score, and we found that the pre-op GCS score of less than 14 was associated with the need of uh, post op ventilation as determined by the ROC curve, uh, significant area under the curve. Similarly, Hunter's score of more than equals to three uh, was signal associated with the need for the post of ventilation. Buffalo's score of more than equals to two was signal associated with the need uh, for the post of ventilation. Uh, Talking the radiological factor, the modified fissure grade, we uh, took out of value of more than equals to two. However, there is no signal association with the uh, need for post of ventilation. And talking about the uh, clinical radical factors, we could find that pre op GCS of less than 14, Hunter's score of more than equals to three, and Dolan's grade of more than equals to two were seen to have seen association. Where the other factors are the state of corrupted aneurysm, modus facial grid, and aneurysm location did not have significant association with the need for the post of ventilation. Uh, so, the interoperative, 
Fact was, interrupted blood loss more than equals 425 ml was seen to have seen association with the need for the post of ventilation. So these are the other factors also taken, such as the post day of surgery and type of surgery, which did not have the uh, signal association, whereas the interrupted blood loss seen, had signal association as evidenced by the uh, less p-value. Uh, there were six mortalities in study. Uh, of these, the pay, uh, four patients uh, they failed to extubate in the post period. Of these, one patient had ac infarction, septic shock. Apart from, from these, there was no other neurological related uh, death. Uh, we also tried to define the association between the post of ventilation and the outcome patient uh, as measured by the MRS code. And we found moderately seen association between the post of ventilation requirement and the function outcome patient. Uh, this was measured with the help of MRS code. And similarly, we also tried to measure with the GS code at the discharge one, six, one month, six month, and the one year post of period. And here also we found moderately significant association between the uh, need for the post of ventilation requirement and the function outcome of the patients. Uh, similarly, uh, the total association between the post oil requirement ICU stay, we could found the strongly similar association with the need for post oil requirement and the duration ICU stay. And in the multivariate analysis, we tried to uh, define the association between the factors and the reason for post oil ventilation. And in this, we took the uh, reason as the advice of anesthesia for the post oil ventilation. And we found that none of the factors are seen association. So we could conclude that the subgroup of patients who were ventilated on advice of anesthesia could have actually been extubated. Similarly, another major reason for the post ventilation was long distance surgery. And in this, we found some of the patients of pre-op GCS, hunter score, and intra blood loss to have seen association with the need for post ventilation. So, hospital in developing countries like ours are limited number of ICU beds and ventilators, and many surgeries are delayed due to non availability of the uh, ICU bed ventilator. And in these settings, period factors that create the need for the ventilator could have actually uh, may have reduced the overestimate of the ICU bed and ventilator. And our study showed the clinical factors like pre-op GCS, Hunter score, and Adolescent score were good predictors for the need for post ventilator. And similar results were seen in other study done by Sidik U et al. In Rosengard et al. have shown a high fissure grade with a statistically component risk for estimation failure, whereas anisomal size and location did not have an effect. Uh, in our study, uh, we took motile fissures grade and the location instead of and these two did not have certain association with the need for the post ventilation. Uh, in regards to surgical factors, our study found the risk of failure high in patients with the high blood loss. And with the various literature, we saw that the various surgical factors like volume of blood loss, duration of surgery, they have suggested to negatively outcome the uh, negatively affect the outcome in anisomal SS patients. Uh, in multivariate analysis, no signal accession could be seen between the pre-op factors and the patients were kept intubated on the advice anesthesia. So these are the group of patients that could have actually been uh, extubated based upon their uh, pre-op factors. Now, also the fact that the signal association of the patients were kept integrated uh, based on the long duration surgery. Uh, so, this is a single center study with small sample size. Uh, we cannot take the angioplasm into account. Uh, this is the first of its time study in Nepal. Uh, the study showed the patients were kept integrated adverse anesthesia could have actually extubated based on pure factors. And this study serves the precedence for the uh, most studies pertinent to this and further uh, future prospective multi center study. So, uh, so I'd like to conclude my presentation saying that the demand for the post of IC bed and ventilator in Amazon SH is overestimated. Uh, simple clinical and surgical factors that can they can better predict the need for the post of ventilation and reduce the burden of reserving IC bed and ventilator. So, lastly, I like to thank my department at KNCTH for the uh, constant support in the study. Uh, thank you. This is a very interesting study. Uh, but a uh, lot of variables are missing, I think. Yes. And uh, one of the major variables that I can, as a you know, uh, surgeon who clip aneurysm, is uh, how well did the surgery go in that particular patient? You know, I think that's the most determining factor in any case where we decide to. So you have indicated by blood loss. Maybe more blood loss means there was an interoperative rupture or something like that. But you didn't talk about interoperative rupture. You were not talking about temporary clipping and the duration of temporary clipping. And mind it that uh, temporary clipping also um, is not the same for every artery. Uh, clipping temporary uh, on MCA is totally different from clipping temporary clip on IC or uh, A1 is totally different. You know, MCA is the worst. You should clip the least MCA. IC you can clip, no problem, because there's a collateral. So these factors has to be considered in your study. 
And, uh, and the major factor that you eventually said was anesthetic factor. The anesthesia didn't want to wait because it was a long hour. He wanted to go home. So they want to keep the patient ventilated, you know. I mean, probably that was the strongest factor in your study. But um, my question is, you know, uh, GCS of 14 and you ventilate post-op. That is very, very unusual in our institute, you know. We will never do that unless there is a, the surgery didn't go well. So can you explain? So, uh, first of all, this is a retrospective study, sir. So, we tried to take all the uh, data, sir. So, in those patients, so we could find the, uh, the sensitive, uh, session data we have included the patients, sir. And talking about this, like, uh, the study is like, uh, there, have no, there have not been previous studies in Nepal related to this. And we tried to do this study because many of times, what happens is that the when you uh, admit anesthesia, an admit anesthesia patient and try to operate them, anesthesia, they ask for a bed and ventilator. So in such cases, the surgery might get delayed. In such situations, this is my job. So we try to find out those factors where we could say that the, this patient does not need the bend ventilator and could go ahead with the surgery. But if there is any like complication during the surgery, that is a different thing. So in those cases, we, say we need a bend ventilator. Whereas in those cases where you see that the patient can do good in the post-op period without a bed and ventilator, ice bend ventilator, so why not go ahead with surgery in those patients? So we just, we try to, uh, this is a retrospective study. So we just try to uh, start uh, some study. So better, uh, we plan to do a prospective study again, sir, with a better uh, data and better outcomes, sir. Uh, so in this case, so, but this is just a start. So we're we trying to, uh, it's a different topic, but then it's a simple, but yet very important topic. So that's where it's starting. Sir. Thank you, Dr. Sandeep. Uh, it's a nice presentation. and. Uh, uh, I also agree with Dr. Pant uh, with uh, his many points that he raised. And um, uh, if I am not mistaken, in your uh, uh, presentation, you mentioned more than half of the cases were elective cases and less than half, maybe 40, 49, I, I forgot the exact percentage, were emergency cases. In contrary, uh, post op ventilation is again more than half and less than half is uh, non ventilated after surgery. So the two are uh, contradictory to each other, isn't it? So how do you defend yourself? So like the uh, majority of patients, uh, since these patients were not intubated in the uh, pre-op period, sir. So what happens is this, when this patient come in the night, we tend to keep them till in the early morning to start surgery in the morning, sir. Because this is not uh, like, uh, these are not intubated and patients were at good GCS, sir. So that is why the patients were getting elective uh, groups, so that's why, sir. Otherwise, sir, we have been like the patient comes at night or it comes in the evening. So we give the patient the next day. So we operate the next day. The thing is that since the uh, it's in routine uh, time, sir. So that's why we have kept it like elective service. Long duration of surgery means how long? Uh, so this is a retrospective study. So we didn't have the actual the exact time, sir. But then in the OT notes, they have mentioned like uh, patient had uh, sub duration like more than four hours. Sir. So we have kept like, more than four hours. We have kept long duration surgery. Thank you. Uh, just uh, comments, uh, not a question. Uh, that if you operate a case uh, after two weeks uh, of the ictus, the brain is more relaxed and there is no need of patient putting on the vent. And we don't put our patient routinely on the ventilator, except uh, patient has some problem during surgery or a patient is uh, too early. <laughs> Our patient has an incidence of rebleed. Uh, secondly, we uh, avoid to put both temporary clips uh, in all cases. If in cases of uh, a calm, if there is a rupture of the aneurysm, we just apply on the one side and we keep on working in spite of little bit bleeding, a um, little bit bleeding, and we don't apply on the other side because a little bit uh, when the other side is intact, uh, you brain can still have the blood supply from the one side. So you can easily manage a little bit bleeding uh, with the, and you keep on dissecting the neck of the aneurysm and you can apply the clip. So um, this is another uh, case that you don't need such sort of uh, hyperventilation post-op in such cases if it is a bleed delayed and if there is a, uh, not temporary clipping applied for more than, uh, especially we maximum wide, as the professor said, in the MCA, we don't apply the temporary clip. If there is bleeding, then you can still keep on working in spite of bleeding and you can apply the clip. Thank you.
Thanks. Hello, Sandeep. It's a nice presentation. What I could not speak in your paper that uh, despite the lack of the ICU bed, that you mentioned, right? What are the other hazards that you are hesitant to put on the ventilation? And how long did you put your patients on the ventilation? That I could not catch in your case. Uh, sir, I've mentioned the mean duration was a 2.66 days. Sir. Patients that kept in the ventilation, the mean duration was 2.6 days. Sir. The ICU stay was around 16.4 days. Sir. Mean ICU stay was 16.4 uh, days. Sir. Uh, so we have the most common ventilator associated pneumonia, sir. Those are the hazards, sir. But then it's a retrospective study, sir. So we could not uh, get those details, sir. So we mostly focused on the like what the study wanted to send. Dr. Bora, there is a lot of questions going on because your paper is interesting. Uh, because it interests many people, you know, that's why. And uh, it's a good thing that you have, you, you, your, you know, methodology is perfect. There's no doubt about that. But uh, there are two school of thoughts. One school of thought, surgeon, want to put every patient into ventilator and sleep. And uh, we don't recommend that in our institute. We, we want to see the patient moving and open eye and then, you know, have the uh, neurological assessment on an awake patient rather than on a ventilated patient, because you will never know in the middle of the night what happens. So that way we do not recommend ventilation as much as possible and ask our anesthetists to wait and wait and wait and uh, see if they move, you know, and then open eyes. So that way, uh, it, it, is, it, is it a practice in your institute to ventilate uh, towards ventilation, more towards ventilation than not towards ventilation. What is the practice? Uh, so we practice patients to extubate as far as possible. But the thing is that many a times anesthesia, they say okay. that it's a it's only night, it's a long duration. And then so so you should put rest. anesthesia as a variable. Okay. <laughs> anesthesia A, anesthesia B, anesthesia C. <laughs> which one want to wake up and which one want to keep them asleep? So, but this is also very like it's uh, divided among neurosurgeons as well. So, during my residency, I could find that some uh, neurosurgeons they wanted to give patient a mandatory little ventilation, and some wanted to extubate uh, right of the surgeons. That is a very different. Thanks. Thank you, sir. Thank you, doctors, for that impressive uh, session. Um, I'm sure it's a tough call for the jury to decide one. Our next award session is Neuro Resident Award. May I sincerely request Dr. Gopal Raman Sarma, Dr. Krishna Sarma, and Dr. Yambahadur Roka to kindly take the seats of jury and invite the first speaker. Hello, good morning, everybody. Now we start the resident neuro resident uh, award the first uh, presenter is mohammad zaidin adil and he will present making sense of intraoperative neuro monitoring communication is the key adil Uh, very good morning to the respected chairpersons, uh, my seniors and colleagues. I'm uh, Zaidan, and today I'm very happy to be here to be able to talk about a technique which we can, in fact, use to increase the effectiveness of our neuromonitoring. Okay, as we all know, intraoperative neuromonitoring is a very useful 
as, uh, tool in the arsenal of a neurosurgeon. However, the issue is that there have been a lot of false positives and a lot of false negatives uh, which are associated uh, with intraoperative neuromonitoring. And as such, what happens is it negates all of the benefits which one can uh, get out of intraoperative neuromonitoring. So what we realized is that most of these errors which actually come up, it is actually due to a miscommunication between stakeholders. And the stakeholders we are talking about here is the uh, neurosurgeon us, the anesthetist, and the uh, the technicians in uh, who are handling these machines. So we need actually a protocol where all of these three uh, parties, in fact, communicate prior to the operation and also during the operation. So as such, we at our uh, center have a protocol-based approach to the intraoperative neuromonitoring. And uh, as you can see, this is our checklist, which we have on the left-hand side of your screen. We'll zoom it up a bit and let's focus first on the far left of your screen. So we've already gotten the date, time, and then the surgery and any event which can come up. So when we talk about uh, any event which can come up, we have come up with a, a tier one and a tier two. So the first three columns, as you can see, the neurophysiologist, which is the technician, the anesthetist, and the neurosurgeon. So during the surgery, if we have an alarm which can come up, if we are warned that something is not going correctly, so we will go across onto the checklist, each and every party of the team, we'll go through this checklist and we'll try to get back the intraoperative neuromonitoring signals as they were to normal. So once this tier one stage is completed and if we still have an alarm, if we still can't sort out the matter, what do we do? We go on to, let's focus onto your right-hand side of the screen here. That is the tier two. So tier two also, we have a few things which we can do to try and get back the patient onto the place where the signals are coming back to normal. However, from tier two, if we still can't get a correction on this, then we'll even have to abandon the surgery. So this in a nutshell is the most important uh, form which we use for each and every patient. So our objective is to discuss the applicability and the relevance of protocol-based approach to intraoperative neuromonitoring. We did a hospital-based retrospective study, and it was a duration of six months which we have done this study. Uh, all the patients who underwent intraoperative neuromonitoring were obviously used. And uh, the important thing was that it's not only the checklist which we've used, however, that all three stakeholders were properly trained. And by this, we use the standardized protocol, which I've already showed you. And for each and every case, this was used meticulously. And it may seem like a lot of work, but it has been used. And this is how we do. Also, the important thing is that prior to the surgery, all three, all three stakeholders will be meeting up and then decide on which case it is, which particular modalities will be needed in these cases. And these modalities will be used. Each and every event was recorded during the surgery. And uh, if, uh, as I've mentioned, tier one, tier two, the necessary steps were taken. It was also confirmed, in fact, if there was a true alarm or not, and as such, correct the situation. So one important thing which can come up is, what did we use? The important thing here is that the induction agent succinylcholine was used. And as you know, it's a neuromuscular blocking agent. However, since one thing is that it's a quick acting agent and after we induced the patient, we did not use any um, neuromuscular blocking agents. Rather, we had uh, gone for uh, maintenance of propofol or uh, Dexmel. So coming to this, on your left-hand side of your screen, we have a EMG which looks uh, quite normal, which you would expect to see. And then on your, the right-hand side, there is in fact a lot of noise, a lot of electrical uh, uh, current can be seen. And these are the things which we want to avoid. These are the alarms which can also come up. So talking about this slide, if we can, we'll focus on the left top hand uh, corner, there are trigger EMG. These are some of the modalities which we use. We use these trigger EMGs, we can use the MEP. If you see uh, the highlighted one in red, it's in fact a drop in the um, the drop in the percentage of the uh, current electrical amplitude which has come. So these are the things which we are looking out for by the technicians, basically. And if you go on to the SSEP on the left bottom hand side, when we say an alarm, we sometimes expect a spike in the amplitude of the waves. However, 
uh, actually the green wave, which you see in the bottom hand side there, that is the normal one. And then the alarm per se is the red one where you see the clear fall in the amplitude. And last, the pedicle screw, which we use here, we have a lot of um, uh, protocols where, for example, when we are using pedicle screws, what we do is that the cutoff we use is uh, seven milliampers. So seven milliampers basically says that we are getting too close to the uh, cord and we might injure it. So by this guidance, we can actually make sure that we do not cause any harm by putting in the pedicle screws. So it's definitely a clear advantage. We used uh, SPSS uh, 23 to analyze the data. And uh, as we see here, female to male ratio was about 40 to 60%. And we operated on almost all uh, age groups uh, of uh, patients as well. As similarly, about 50 to 50% were of the elective and the emergency uh, based surgeries. And as you can see, all types of surgeries from cranial to uh, lumbar were used in our study. These are the modalities which we have used. We've used almost all patients EMG and also SSCP up to pedicle screws as well. Coming to this slide, this is one of the most important slides, I would say. So as you see, the total number of patients was 77. And this slide shows, in fact, how many of the patients indeed had alarms. So as you can see, there were 26 patients who had alarms. So the alarms can come up in terms of uh, pedicle screws, in terms of MEPs. So once this happens, we need to see what we need to do. So this result shows that all 26 patients, we intervened in the first year as seen in the checklist, and we were actually able to get the intraoperative neuromonitoring signals back to a normal one. So as such, we did not need to go to a tier two intervention. And as such, none of the surgeries were also abandoned. Here we see that 26 in 77 patients had alarms, as I've said. However, if I can take your attention onto the left uh, bottom corner, no post-operative deficits. None of our patients, which we looked at, had post-operative deficits. And as you can see, even when the alarms were present in the 26 patients, there were no deficits. And those who did not have any alarms also, 51 patients, they too did not have any deficits. As such, I would like to say two uh, studies which have been done. One is by uh, Chantel and colleagues, uh, which showed a lot of promise where they used uh, to input the data and record these uh, intraoperative complications. And it was shown to have a lot of promise. Similar promise was also seen by John and colleagues where they also did um, uh, the, an evidence-based algorithm checklist, in fact, and it increased the usability and feasibility of these things. And our study also showed no pos true positives and thus no uh, post-operative deficits while using a protocol-based uh, intraoperative neuromonitoring. And this is the most important thing is that all stakeholders were involved. So I'd like to conclude this by saying that the use of protocol-based intraoperative neuromonitoring should be implemented in all uh, places where possible. And uh, basically it's because it has shown to have the best results and it minimizes the risk of false positives and uh, false negative findings. As such, there would be a high sensitivity, a high specificity, which uh, would uh, lead to a much better patient safety. And uh, as uh, medical personnel, as surgeons, we uh, are always focused on the most important thing. And uh, I think that would be patient safety. Thank you. Yeah, good presentation. Thank you, Adi. Thank you, sir. Uh, I would like to ask one question. Sure. In your case series, three aneurysm cases were monitored, right? Yes, what was the indication for that? Um, three of them, uh, two of them were ruptured uh, aneurysm, and uh, the third one had uh, multiple aneurysms, in fact. Uh, and uh, it was uh, one in the A1 distal segment, which was ruptured, and then uh, one in the <coughs> calosome marginal uh, uh, segment as well, which was not ruptured. So we ended up uh, clipping both those aneurysms. And this patient also had the basilar tip aneurysm as well, which we did not do anything about as uh, <clears throat> at that time, there was no need for it. And uh, this patient also did not uh, have any post-operative uh, deficits. Thank you. Uh, uh, great presentation. Thank you. My question is, you you're trying to say with your protocol, the surgery has become very safe. Yes. 
So, I mean, I see we do it on all the time, like when there is uh, some problem, the anesthetist or the neurophysiologist communicate to the surgeon. I feel that is a routine, not a protocol. But in addition, do you have any comparison in your institute before the protocol and after the protocol, any result difference? Um, our study actually did not uh, check regarding the um, the previous uh, things which were done. However, from the beginning itself, uh, along with the intraoperative neuromonitoring, we've been using this protocol-based approach for one thing. And uh, it's uh, great to uh, actually be able to say that all patients who undergo the surgery in our center uh, will have the intraoperative neuromonitoring uh, free of charge. So uh, all of the, uh, nobody is uh, devoid of this uh, uh, facility for the patients. So the indication is free of charge rather than uh, medical indication. Uh, sorry, sir. The indication of neuromonitoring was free of charge. Then yes, um, any uh, any uh, surgery which we which can have in fact a deficit, which can come up, we use for all the cases. So basically, each and every case we use the intraoperative neuromonitor, whether it be elective or emergency cases. Okay? Thank you very much. Thanks. Uh, can we can you call up on uh, Rupesh Chakradhar, please? Good morning, respected chairperson, distinguished guests, and all the participants. Myself, Dr. Rupesh Chakradhar presenting on the topic demographic clinical the pathological characteristics and outcome of primary spinal tumor in a uh, tertiary care center in Nepal. There's no conflict of interest in my study. So to start with, uh, primary tumors of the spinal cord, spinal meninges and cauda, uh, uh, they are subsequently referred to as uh, spinal tumors. And they occur one in every 10 intragranular neoplasms. And with the incidence uh, mentioned around four to 8% of all primary CNS tumor. And on that, uh, intracranial tumors, uh, there is no association uh, with increasing grade of malignancy and age at diagnosis. So uh, they are histologically diverse owing to the fact that they have origination from a uh, multitude of precursor cells and histology varies uh, depending upon the anatomical uh, site, uh, which forms the basis for the classification into intradural, intramedullary, comprising around 20 to 30 percent, intradural, extramedullary, around 70 to 80 percent, and extradural tumors, they are mostly, uh, they are primarily metastatic in origin. And they present with uh, different presentation based on the location. So a um, series of 202 patients uh, of intramedullary spinal cords, uh, they have mentioned that the most common presentation is pain uh, in the form of back pain, radicular pain, and central pains. And the second presentation is a motor disturbance due to radiculopathy or uh, and, and presenting in the form of limb weakness, sensory loss, followed by sphincter disturbance, which occurs uh, as a least common presentation. And there are two. Uh, population-based data on the demographic uh, as well as the clinical and histological uh, types of the tumor. And uh, owing to the fact uh, that there are few uh, these uh, studies, uh, we depend on the local hospital-based registries to describe spinal tumors in low-income countries like Nepal. So the main uh, purpose of my study is to augment the current literature on these tumors at the national level. Uh, however, more and more institutional-based um, data are required to assess the actual disease load in our country. And so objective is to describe the demographic, clinical, histopathological characteristics of primary spinal tumors in TUTS and to assess the outcome of primary spinal tumors using Macron's scale at admission and in three months follow. Yeah. So it is a retrospective hospital-based study done at TUTS uh, over a period of three years and all the patients admitted and operated uh, for spinal tumors are uh, the study populations and review of hospital charts, discharge summaries, and follow-up reports are used for data collection. And this is a flowchart showing uh, uh, brain and spinal tumors that were operated in the study period. So total intracranial tumor cases were 405, and out of that, uh, total spinal tumors were 72, and we included 67 patients because we lost two follow-up three patients, and in two, we could not trace it, so pathology reports. So uh, three months follow-up was done based on the OBD visits and the phone calls. And these are my study variables. 
So the patient's clinical outcomes are evaluated using McCormick's cell admission and treatment follow-up, and outcome was uh, 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 labeled as improved if they have uh, decreased in their McCormick grade. Uh, if their grade is similar, then we label it as stable, and if there is increasing grade, we call it deteriorated. So this is the modified macronic scale that we use. Grade one means intact neurology, and grade five is paraplegic or quadriplegic, so even without trigger movement. So statistical analysis performed using IBM SPSS Statistics 21, and continuous data expressed as means and standard deviations, normal data expressed as frequencies and proportions. Uh, ethical epigraph was taken from IRC. Just talking about the results, uh, we had a total of 30 females and 37 males, with male to female ratio 1.23 is to 1. And uh, on the right, we can see the age distributions where we can see that around 32.8% uh, belong to the age group 40 to 59, with the mean age of 33.94. And uh, in this table, we can see that the most of the patients, they had sensory and motor symptoms around 44.7%. However, the duration of symptoms was from uh, range from two months to four years. And uh, in our patients, uh, maximum of the patients had uh, the tumor at uh, thoracic level, 43.3%. Mm, and these are the uh, site and histopathological uh, diagnosis of the tumors. Uh, we had 61.2% uh, IDEM, followed by 18% uh, uh, intramedullary and uh, only 14% extramedullary, extramedullary, sorry. And uh, we achieved uh, gross total dissections in 76.1% of the patients, uh, subtotal in 17.9% um, and biopsy only in three pa uh, six patients. And we operated under microscope and laminoplasty was done uh, if we had three or more level of exploration. And uh, this table shows the uh, outcomes uh, based on macron grade. And uh, we had uh, in the post operative period uh, in the three months follow-up, we had 71.6% had improved neurology to grade one. 20.8% to grade 2, and 5.9% into grade 3, and 1.7% to uh, grade 4. And overall, uh, in 80.5% of the patients, there was neurological improvement at least by grade 1, and 14.6% uh, had stable neurology, and in 4.9% uh, the patients had a deterioration in the grade. And one patient uh, with C71 intermediary lipoma, it died uh, around after two months in the rehab center, which was not directly related to surgeries, and there was no um, infections in our study. So, uh, coming to discussion, we tried to analyze hospital-based data on demographics, clinical characteristics, and outcome of spinal tumors. And our study had male preponderance, uh, which was almost similar to the finding by uh, uh, Selinger et al. And with the male to female ratio of 1.23 is to 1. And in our study, uh, maximum patients were uh, of the age group 40 to 60, with mean is 33.94 percent. Uh, and one study by uh, Kalki AS. Uh, uh, of, from our department, uh, one year back uh, had um, most of the patients belonging to the age group less than 20. Mm, and mean overall age at diagnosis was 49.6 years in the West uh, as per the paper published in uh, Prescience Medical Journal 2004. Mm, and they have said that uh, because of the uh, longevity of the lifespans, uh, they had delayed presentations. And every duration of presenting symptoms was 11.1 months in our series, while previous reports ranged from two months to nine months. Mm, uh, and this was the paper published by Buffett et al. Mm, which says that uh, the patients with primary spinal cord tumors, they had pain and weakness as the predominant presenting features, uh, similar to our findings. Mm, and the most type of uh, primary spinal tumors was uh, IDM, 61.2%, followed by intramedular and extradural, which are similar to finding in most of the series mentioned below. And the most common spinal tumor was meningioma, uh, occurring 29% uh, in uh, selling the atrial studies, whereas it was a uh, swanoma in our series. And our study, uh, in our study, the most uh, common spinal uh, label was uh, thoracic, uh, followed by cervical and lumbar, uh, which is comparable to um, the findings of the data reported by Jew et al. Um, and in another study also, the thoracic uh, leg cord was the most commonly involved uh, location, followed by cervical and sacral uh, subsequently. Um, so this is a paper by Sarma uh, et al. In our country, uh, when you can see that the most common extradural tumor was neurofibroma, Mm, in occurring in 44.4 percent, but in our study it was swanoma. And another uh, subsequent paper by Sarma et al. Uh, mentioning about the functional outcome of IDEM, uh, uh, they said that functional outcome of spinal tumors after uh, total surgical resection was excellent, uh, with more than 95 percent of patients in their series had near to normal functional outcome after three months because they had previously included most of the patients with uh, grade one neurology. So, um, but our study had 80.5 percent had improved neurological status, uh, and one of the patients uh, in our study, as mentioned, died of unknown cause while getting 
uh, into rehab center after around two months, which is directly not related to surgery. So to summarize, spinal tumors um, are slightly more common in males. Uh, both sensory and motor symptoms are the common presentations, and most common site is, uh, is IDEM, and common histological findings overall in our case is aswanoma. And post-operative neurological deterioration is very uncommon. So this is not directly related to morbidity. And to conclude, um, though my study did not add any new information, but it confirms the previous uh, findings of the demographic uh, clinical features and histopathological uh, findings. Uh, and advancement in diagnostic, surgical techniques, equipment, and uh, oncological treatment has uh, led to improve, overall improvement in the outcome. And there's no uh, significant mortality and morbidity with the spinal tumors. Thank you. So, you see, it's a good paper, but uh, the outcome of intermedullary tumor and outcome of intradural extramedullary tumors quite different, right? So, if you had separated it, and the outcome will have been different. So, what factors determines the outcome of this surgical outcome of the tumors? What are the factors that determines? The first is uh, the extent of the tumor and uh, the histopathological finding also, and whether it's intramedular or extramedular, that also determines uh, mostly the extradural and uh, the, this uh, intramedular but extramedular tumors, they have significant improvement, unlike the intramedular ones. Uh. But in, in the immediate post-op, uh, though the intramedullary uh, cases, they have no rapid improvement, but in due course of time, they also show improvements. So, so these are the, some factors that determine the outcome. And in your cases, series, did you use the neurophysiological monitoring? Uh, I did not mention, but uh, in every spine case tumor, so we use it. Sir. Do you use it? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I saw there were three cases of biopsies you have done. Which which was the three cases? Mm -hmm. So one was a uh, case of lymphoma, which turned out to be lymphoma, and another was a, a diffuse uh, tumor uh, in which uh, we could not uh, just, uh, just remove the tumor in but so we just did biopsy. And in another case, uh, we plan to remove, but because of uh, massive bleeding, we just landed up with biopsies. So is there any post-op deficit or anything because of the massive bleeding or anything? Um, okay, and how many cases, is there a trend of sending intraop, you know, cytology or person or in pain cytology, which may determine the extent of surgery you want to do? Um, I think so, we did a uh, frozen section in one case, uh, and I do not exactly remember, but we uh, just do not routinely send for uh, that frozen section. Okay, and final question is like, when you're doing sonoma surgery, do you go for the nerve preservation surgery or you just... When they excise the nerves. In Swanama? Yeah. Mm, we try to preserve as much as possible. Sir. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, now we'd like to call the uh, third uh, speaker for today. And he's uh, Dr. Sandesh Dal, and he'll be talking. So we'll be talking on outcome of traumatic brain injury in pediatric population, a single center experience in Nepal. Good morning, uh, respected chairpersons, distinguished guests. Uh, <clears throat> I'm lucky to uh, get an opportunity to present in this forum. And today I'm going to uh, talk about the periodic head injury, a single center experience. So periodic in head injury, it is one of the uh, common cause for emergency visit. And uh, in, in the data of United States, about uh, 500,000 emergency department visits and 60,000 hospitalizations, according to data in 2017. And Nepal's population, we have a very young, uh, population in Nepal, and about 40% of our population, they lie below the age of 18 years. So this is uh, one of the important topics. So what are our experiences in Nepal? What are the papers from Nepal in the past? So this paper, uh, uh, this study, retrospective series, it was uh, done in TUTH in 2006, and it showed uh, the results as uh, the 
Like children of less than 18 years were taken in this study. And the study was done in 2001 to 2004. It was a retrospective study. And it consisted of 352 cases. And the head injury was far more common than the spine injuries. And the commonest cause was fall. And we can see here the main hour of presentation to the hospital is 31 hours. It's because of difficult geography of Nepal. So this is another study. Uh, this was done in Dharan. And uh, the study comprised of 43 uh, uh, children and male were more common. And again, in this study, the fall was more common and mild, injury, mild head injuries that accounted for about two third of the uh, patients. And so this is another study uh, that was uh, published and it was a prospective study. Uh, this was published from Pokhara and it consisted of uh, one year and it uh, uh, included the patients of up to the age of 15 years. And again, in this study, male population were more involved. And also in this study, the fall was the most common. And 16% of the population, they regard surgery. And this uh, was published in 2020. And this uh, included 43 patients. This one, this, this included 65 patients in two years with a median age of 10 years. And also here, the fall is the most common and mild is present in more than 50% of the patients. So about the study, so we just wanted to look if there is any case uh, scenario change in causation of the outcome of the patients with the fall injury. And it is a retrospective single uh, center study uh, with a study duration of one year. And the analyzed data with demography, diagnosis, mode of treatment, outcome. And so, uh, regarding the pediatric trauma cases in emergency, 112 cases came under neurosurgery, which accounted for about 13% of the cases which were analyzed. And so how much healthcare did it utilize is, it uh, included 10% of the all neurosurgical operations in TUTH, was related to uh, pediatric trauma. And it uh, comprised of 36% of the pediatric emergency neurosurgical operations. And it included 20% of all the bariatric neurosurgical uh, operations done in Trivon University Teaching Hospital in last one year. So was comprised of about 735 hospital beds were utilized because of bariatric trauma. So regarding the uh, incidents, uh, what we can see is uh, the Chaitra, Baisak and Jest, they were the peak uh, months in which the uh, children mostly presented with the head injury. And it was highest in April, May, and June, and the lowest in the September and October. And partly because uh, uh, there was also this COVID crisis. So uh, that might be the cause where it is lowest in September and October. And regarding the age group of the children, when uh, we, can, we can see this chart that the, uh, the head trauma exists in uh, almost 50-50 with the age of more than five years and less than five years. However, uh, this is less common in uh, less than one year because the children are well taken care of. And the age of one to five years in which the child is mostly mobile. So they get uh, injured most of the time. So median age of presentation was about 5.5 years. And regarding the sex, the, again, in the, also in this study, the male children were injured more than the female with a ratio of seven is to three. And the sex of the child was observed for any significant correlation with the mode of injury and which was not found. And so regarding the geography, uh, in the map, we can see uh, the, from where the cases were referred from here. And uh, we can see the circle that, so this is the catchment area of Trivon University Teaching Hospital. So most cases were referred from here and very few cases from first province were referred to us. And when, uh, we can, when we compare the previous uh, data with the another data, where we can see uh, the second data, it shows the uh, availability of the neurosurgical facility. So many neurosurgical centers are there in province one. So very few cases were referred from province one to uh, our center. So regarding the mode of injury, the fall was uh, the most common mode of injury, which accounted for more than three fourths of the cases. And the second was the road traffic accident, which account for about 20% of the cases. So 
the time of presentation of the injury. So almost 50% presented within 24 hours and uh, even more than 50% they presented late. So, and even some cases uh, presented about 10% of the cases they presented after 72 hours of injury. So there is also, there is still a uh, geographical factor which is uh, causing some delay in the treatment of children with head injury. So correlation of the uh, outcome, correlation of uh, time of arrival and outcome uh, was seen. However, uh, it was not significant, but the cause might be, we had a very few cases of very severe traumatic head injury. So they might have been primarily managed in outside center or uh, something else might have happened to them. So uh, it could not have been found to be significant. And in the presenting complaints, vomiting was the most common presentation followed by loss of consciousness for a variable time period. This was the second most common presentation. And the occurrence of seizure was found in about 12% of the uh, children. And the, uh, the occurrence of seizure was compared to the uh, outcome and it was not uh, significant. And the majority, uh, and regarding the occurrence of scalp or skull injury, the 41, they did not have any skull fracture or skull laceration and they had the underlying uh, brain injury. And the most common uh, scalp or skull uh, injury was a simple linear fracture, which was followed by uh, depressed fracture. And regarding the brain injury, about uh, 68 had some form of uh, abnormal brain uh, CT, which accounted for about 60% of the admitted cases. And the extra axial hematoma, it was the most common finding in CT scan. And regarding the head injury grades according to classocoma scale, and the uh, most of the cases were mild head injury followed by moderate, and very few cases of severe head injury were admitted. And uh, most of the patients, almost about 50% uh, of the patients were admitted to ward and uh, others required high dependency unit and about 12% uh, of the children, they required ICU care. So the mean ICU stay uh, was two days and mean hospital stay was seven days. And regarding the treatment, most of the cases were treated uh, conservatively and uh, about 30% of the cases, they required some of uh, some form of uh, surgical intervention. And the most common surgery done was a craniotomy, uh, mostly for the evacuation of hematoma. And the second one was a, a debridement and suturing for major skull laceration. And uh, two of the cases, they required decompressive craniotomy. And the treatment versus outcome, the surgical, uh, the patients who required surgery did not have worse outcome than compared to the conservative group. And the associated injury, the isolated head injury was far more common than associated spine or other injuries. So outcome, majority of the children, they had a Glasgow outcome, good outcome scale, and about 5%, they had a, a bad outcome scale. So, and the, most of them were disposed to home and 3% were required to uh, the rehabilitation. And so in summary, the periodic head injury is significant source of utilization, uh, health resource utilization. And most cases are fall followed by RTA. And uh, one tenth were present with seizure and overall outcome in periodic head injury was good. So this, this was a single study, retrospective, and low sample numbers in some of the categories like poor outcome group, severe head injury, physical assault. So hence making statistical comparison a bit difficult. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I see that uh, this is studies on pediatrics and uh, quite a big volume is less than five years of age. And you have taken the assessment as a Glasgow comma scale and as well as a Glasgow outcome scale. Can you, do you think you can assess the conscious level in less than a year or less with the Glasgow comma scale? Do you think this uh -huh. study will be valid with this one? Uh, if uh, the children is uh, typically of age of less than four years, then we use a periodic Glasgow comma scale in such cases. And if the size but, is more than but four years- all chart says is Glasgow comma scale. Mm -hmm. But in fact, the periodic classical coma scale was used in uh, less than four years, and every four years, uh, the normal classical coma scale was used. 
if it should have been mentioned, I, I forgot. I'm sorry. Sir. In your in your study, you see the Chait Baisak Jeta Asar was the most uh, common months to have. You see the uh, the shed injury. What was the reason for that? Do you have any idea? I think that is a summer reason, and uh, everyone is active, so that might be one cause. But particularly, I don't know. Or the another reason is most of the children they came with fall mostly from the window. So that is a season where everyone is working in the field. So that the child may be left alone and they, they might have suffered the injury. That might be in the process. Okay, thank you. We would actually call the next paper yeah. for today. <coughs> Dr. Can I, can I just add one, one point just? Oh, okay, sorry. So I think this is a very, very important uh, topic that you have brought. And um, uh, accident in children in Nepal is like epidemics. And a uh, lot of children are falling from the same window repeatedly. And uh, in our institute, there is one case where uh, the child came for three times falling from the same window and eventually died. And um, in New York, when they started having a high rise building, then there was a similar epidemics there. And they started a program called Child Cannot Fly. Uh, the program is still on, the NGO, it's an international NGO, which is still on. So I think there should be a lot of prevention of, you know, child who is falling. And uh, at least the social workers should go and ask the parents why the child has fallen, because it's totally a mistake of the parents. And we never question parents, you know. In the West, uh, the police will go to their home and then see whether this parent is capable of taking care of this child or not. Because they think children are the property of the nation. So that way, I think this is an appropriate forum for to discuss this. Thank you very much that you brought up. And I rec recommend Nations Committee <laughs> to bring this chapter. And I also recommend that we should work with nurses because nurses have a chapter where and how to prevent uh, injury in children and this thing. Doctors have no, never been taught like this. So I think we should uh, work with our colleague uh, nurses uh, to bring preventive aspect as well. Thank you very much. Thank you. Sirs. So we'd like to call uh, next speaker is Dr. Susan Sister. He'll be talking on ultrasonographic measurement of optic nerve sheet diameter in TBA. Good morning, respected chairperson, professors, seniors, and colleagues. I'll be presenting on a novel trias tool for traumatic brain injury. It is simple, but very effective and especially latent. So I am Dr. Susan Sraster, currently studying residency in Kathmandu Medical College. So we all know about the global burden of the traumatic brain injury. Here we can see the facts. But if we think that low and middle income countries are spared from this traumatic brain injury burden, no, it is not. In Nepal only, there is annual incidence of 200 to 400 cases per 1 lakh. And over the decades after the Ranjan, various neuroimaging techniques have developed. And then among this, we know that majority of the patient die from traumatic brain injury due to the uncontrolled rise of intracranial pressure. And mainly it is due to the feed forward cycle of the raised intracranial pressure. So we must focus on the prevention of this rise in uh, rise in the intracranial pressure and prompt intervention. How this can be achieved? This can be achieved by invasive monitoring, intensive monitoring. And how this can, we all know the gold standard is the extraventricular drainage, but a very simple non-invasive method which has been hidden, that is the measurement of ultrasonic measurement, optic nerve sheath diameter. So, so both Rotterdam City score and ONST are independent outcome predictor. But when we correlate, is there a correlation of city major ONST with Rotterdam City score? Yes, this is the question to be answered. And yes, there are, but very few papers have been published. And in the uh, institute where we have been doing ultrasonography very routinely, even in ICU emergencies, the question arises, is there a correlation of ultrasonic measure, optic nerve sheet diameter with the Rotterdam City scoring system? Yet published? No. The answer is no. It has not been published. So this study aimed to correlate this 
ultrasonography measured optic nerves with diameter with rotenum CT scoring system in the patients with traumatic brain injury. And if there is a correlation, can it be used as a novel trials tool? So with this questions raised, these are the two primary objectives of my study. And also the next objective is to study the correlation of ultrasonography measured optic nerves with diameter with outcome of the patient. So the study was taken place in Kathmandu Medical College of six months durations, with this, which is a retrospective observational study and approval was taken from the IRC committee. So demographic data were obtained and uh, score of four in Rotterdam City scoring system was uh, up obtained as a cutoff value. Similarly, 0.5 centimeter was the cutoff value for ultrasonography measured optic nerves with diameter. And this is the USC machine, and this is the method how we use and take ultrasonography measured optic nerves with diameter 0.3 centimeter behind the globe in the chart in the chart that we can see, and uh, we can uh, and transfer diameter is the diameter that we measure as optic nerves with diameter. And outcome were measured at the time of discharge, and poor outcome were those who had a modified ranking score of three or four more. And all the adult patients with age grade and having ONST and CT scan, scan has been done were included. And these are some of the exclusion criteria which must be excluded because of the reasons. And data were analyzed using the SPSS, and person correlation was used to correlate between the two variables. So out of the 198 patients, we see that majority of the cases were less than 50 years with average age of 47 years, and most of the cases were male. And most of the cases, 27% had high ONST and 14% had high RCTS score. And 14% uh, had poor outcome. It may look that poor outcome is 14%, RCTS is also 14%, so this is on, but this is not the fact. So which we'll be dealing in the results. The results suggested that majority of the cases were fall injury, so followed by the motor vehicle accident. And most of the cases that we got was mild traumatic brain injury. So here we can see that 73% of the cases had lower ONST scores and 84% who had low ONST scores had low rotundum CT scoring system. And 96% in the right side, we can see that out of the 96%, of the patient at high ONST score and high RCTS score. So correlation was done. And it suggested that there was a strong correlation of 75.7% .7 with very significant p-value. So now uh, comparing with the outcome, we can see out of the 73% and 83% with good outcome as low ONST and 86% with very high ONST at poor outcome. Thus, it suggested that ONST can predict the outcome independently with 83% sensitivity and 86% specificity. Similarly, uh, we can see that the OSH ratio is 29 in uh, the patient with uh, high ONST and similarly 20 in the patient with high RCTS score. These are the different boxes. So what we can say is that patient with high ONST can predict poor outcome. That is 30 times more likely that the high ONST patient will have high uh, poor outcome and than, than, than that of the rotenum CT scoring system where it can predict 20 times. So uh, we can say that high ONST can supplement that it can be used as a novel trial tool. So we should never forget about the impact trial because it has its impact on as a CT scan and rotenum CT scoring system and a necessity for the surgical intervention. But ultrasonography measured optic nerves with diameter has been used in critical care units. It's, it is validated. Although MRI and CT has been objective and precise, but the main problem is its cost. Not only the cost, its difficulty in repeatability and reproducibility, as well as on availability. On availability, whether it is in the form of available of CT scan or technical studies, many patients have to uh, come for referral and they have to come with uh, many physical, mental, social sufferings. So to Counter these sufferings, what we have, the answer is the very handy ultrasonography machine with the uh, very high sensitivity and specificity, which is also comparable to the other international studies. And when the correlation was done between these studies, there was no study comparing to our studies, to our results. But however, when we compare with the city guided ONST, it has a strong correlation between the Rotterdam city score and city guided ONST as per the international paper.
And similarly to the, uh, this study, to the best of my knowledge, I, it is the first paper that incorporates ultrasonograph measurement as a measurement in association with RCTS. As a predictor, also it has got very high sensitivity, and it is uh, 30 times more likely that it will predict that it has got poor outcome. And similarly, not only this, it has an adv added advantage of non-invasive, portable, repeatable, reproducible, and the serial measurement can be done everywhere in ICU, everywhere, even we guess anywhere, if there is a chances that a patient has dropped GCS, we have to use it. In no time, it will determine its result. So uh, many questions are asked regarding its learning curve. Many papers have published that only after the 17 cases, uh, we can uh, say uh, that uh, the ONST has very significant reduction in the intra and uh, intra observer variation. And similar uh, paper was also uh, done in our hospital, and it has suggested that there was a high intra and inter observer agreement. Thus, we can say ultrasonograph measurement of technology diameter can be used as a novel trial tool. However, it has its pitfalls being a single center study and a sm some small sample size. And also, there are no comparison that we can do because the data that we have is very few. And despite these limitations, it sets the precedence for the more studies pertaining to this in correlation. Also, it acts as a pathway for serial measurement of the optic nausea diameter. And also, it can be used as a novel trial tool. Thus, in my conclusion, what I can conclude is that there is a strong correlation between the ultrasonographic measurement optic nausea diameter and rotundum CT scoring system. And it can be used as an initial novel trial tool in high prevalence to rule in the diagnosis and low prevalence to rule out elevated intracranial reproduction. So my take home message is that in every institution, we must perform this ultrasonographic measurement optic north seat diameter. Thank you for thank you for your attention. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Susan. That's a very interesting and uh, in fact, as you said, I think it's one of the first studies being conducted. A few questions. The first thing is, like you said, that 86, I think, percentage of your cases were mild TBI. So what's the uh, role? Like, why do you want to get, you know, uh, optic nerve sheet diameter in mild TBI cases? Because what's the cutoff for your ONSD? Like, what is the cutoff size? How many millimeters have you taken? Yeah, it's, it's mentioned in the sorry, 0, uh, 0 0.5 centimeter is the cutoff value. Right. So it's, and uh, okay. the method we choose is uh, societal and that uh, uh, coronal plane, and we uh, took 0.3 centimeter below the globe, and then transverse diameter is taken as the optic nausea diameter. And also, in our hospital, there is a recording system of optic nausea diameter in ultrasonography, so that we cross check when the patient is admitted. True. So five millimeter usually is taken for uh, you know CBI, TBI, and you know, cases of high ICP. So what I'm asking is, why were you doing in mild TBI cases? No, the, uh, in every cases we screen the patient for mild, mild, whether it is mild or severe traumatic brain injury, we do the uh, optic nausea diameter. This is our hospital protocols. Okay. And the next thing is, uh, did you compare it with the fine slice CT cuts? Because ultras, uh, can compare to, you know, ONSD, fine cut CT slices of the optic nerve sheet diameter is more reproducible and is more reliable. So is there any comparison between the two? No, I haven't compared. Okay, because I think that will be much better, you know. Yes, for, I haven't compared, studies. but uh, the study suggests that uh, the uh, CT scan is, yes, uh, I've also mentioned that the CT scan, the guided ONST measurement is accurate, but the problem is in its repeatability. We cannot repeat CT scan in every case, and we cannot do CT scan in everywhere. That is the main uh, purpose of this study. Fine. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Now, can we uh, call upon Dr. Prakash Rester, please? He'll be talking on carry one mal malformation, metric analysis of posterior fossa and review of literature. Yes, sorry. I'm sorry, it was Rizu's turn. I think we'll have Rizu after this. It's all right, Rizu? Okay. Thanks. <laughs> 
प्रकाश Okay, fine. Uh, we'd like to call the next speaker uh, because there are, I think, some technical problem. Dr. Izu Dahal, I seem to be talking about resection sparing or sparing of MRI normal hippocampus. Good morning, chairpersons, dear seniors, and everybody present here. I am Dr. Rizu Dahal, and uh, I am currently uh, in third year of my MD PhD in neurosurgery training in Nara Medical University in Japan. And I'll be talking about uh, epilepsy surgery and how to decide whether to resect or spare a MI normal hippocampus. Uh, introduction. Uh, so, uh, in patients who have MRI negative temporal lobe epilepsy and patients who have lateral lesional temporal lobe epilepsy, in both of these patients, the hippocampus is normal. And although the hippocampus is normal, it can be epileptogenic. As studies show that 70% of MRI negative cases and 50% of lateral lesional cases show hippocampal involvement. And the resection of such hippocampus results in good postoperative seizure control. But sparing of such hippocampus is one of the most common causes of surgical failure in temporal lobe epilepsy patients and results in early seizure recurrence. But there is also a very high risk of resecting a apparently normal hippocampus. A study done by Hempsteader year shows that the decline in verbal and visual memory is much more severe when a MRI normal hippocampus is resected compared to when a sclerotic hippocampus is resected. And conventionally, we would do a subdural, chronic subdural EKG or stereotactic EEG in these patients, but intraoperative EKG has also been found to be useful, and it's certainly less invasive. The spikes seen during intraoperative EKG help guide resections, but some of the limitations are that it evaluates the irritative zone, and many studies have shown that not all spiking areas need to be resected, and that would certainly be a limitation in an MRI normal hippocampus where most of our intentions are on preserving the cognition. Mm -hmm. But apart from spikes, there are new epileptogenic biomarkers, such as uh, on the left side, if you will, uh, high frequency oscillations, which are these very fast activities of about 500 hertz, and phase amplitude coupling, which is the coupling of fast activity with a phase of slow wave. And both of these activities have been found to be higher in the epileptogenic regions. And the study done by Smith et al. here shows that resection guided by HFO actually had better postoperative seizure outcome than the one guided by spikes. But all of these biomarkers are affected by anesthetic agents. Uh, but some of the anesthetic agents, for example, sevoflurane, has been found to enhance the biomarkers. And uh, for several studies shows that spikes increased in the epileptogenic regions. So did HFO co-occurring with spikes in sclerotic hippocampus as well as phase amplitude coupling in different etiologies. But MRI negative uh, hippocampus, it has a different electrophysiopathological findings. So uh, the objective of our study is to assess the reactivity of all the epileptogenic biomarkers available, which are spikes, HFO, HFO on spikes, and phase amplitude coupling at two concentrations of sevoflurane. And we hypothesize that this can help us decide whether to resect or spare a MRI normal hippocampus. So coming to the methods, uh, 11 patients were included in the study. All patients had temporal lobe epilepsy. All of them had a normal hippocampus on MRI. Five patients hippocampus was uh, not epileptogenic included in the ictal minus group, as indicated by the red circle, which shows the epileptogenic focus to be in the lateral neocortex. And uh, six patients hippocampus was epileptogenic included in the ictal plus group, as indicated by the red circle. Uh, the electrode is in the subtemporal region, uh, recording from the parahippocampal gyrus. 
So it's a retrospective study. All of the patients underwent extraoperative EcoG uh, for seven days, and intraoperative EcoG was done at the time of second surgery under 0.5 mac and 1.5 mac of sevoflurane. And those are the uh, software and statistical methods. Uh, the, these are the example of HFO. In A, you can see that uh, there's raw EEG and filtered EEG shows a very fast activity and a time frequency blob. And D shows HFO co-occurring with spikes, which is assumed to be even more epileptogenic. C and B are artifacts, example of artifacts. So coming to results, a clinical profile, uh, the age range of patients ranged from 30 to 52 with median, uh, th sorry, 13 to 52 with median of 32. Uh, seven patients uh, had right side uh, temporal lobe epilepsy, four patients had left side. And uh, the seven patients had MRI negative temporal lobe epilepsy, while four patients had different other etiologies. Uh, coming to the biomarkers themselves, we can see uh, in A, spikes increased with increasing sevoflurin concentration and increase was much higher in the ICTL plus group. The same for HFO co-occurring with spikes in E and for phase amplitude coupling at the lower half of the page. As for HFO, which is supposed to be higher in the epileptogenic region, it was found to paradoxically increase in the non-epileptogenic regions. Now, if we look at the individual patient's reaction to uh, sevoflurane, we can see that spikes increased with increasing concentration in every patient in the ictal plus group, while none of the patients in the ictal minus group showed an increase. Same goes for HFO co-occurring with spikes and for phase amplitude coupling. As for HFO, uh, it showed a paradoxical increase in every patient who had a in the ictal minus group. So um, coming to discussion, so from our findings, MRI normal epileptogenic hippocampus shows increased rate of spikes HFO with spikes and phase amplitude coupling, while MRI normal non-epileptogenic hippocampus shows increase in rates of HFO. So trying to make sense of what happened, several studies have shown that semaflurane causes neuronal excitation. And it is possible that the epileptogenic hippocampus has a very low threshold for excitation. And because uh, at a, so it is able to fire fast and early at a low concentration of sevoflurane, while it takes a much higher concentration of sevoflurane to activate a MR uh, non epileptogenic hippocampus. And uh, several studies have shown that changes in ion concentration and inhibition can have non epileptogenic region produce higher rates of HFO. And that is what we assume happened in our study. Uh, as for fast ripple, uh, as for HFOs co-occurring with spikes, you can see in the figure below there that they are more sensitive and specific than HFO alone or spike alone. Uh, this is because there, it's a combination of two biomarkers. So it's essentially representing two epileptogenic processes. So uh, the similar finding was observed in our study that HFO, if it co-occurred with spikes, it would increase in concentration in, uh, it would increase in rate with increasing sevoflurane concentration if the hippocampus was epileptogenic. For phase amplitude coupling, it's the coupling of a slow wave with a very high amplitude activity. And we know spikes have a very high amplitude, especially the spikes that are coming from the epileptogenic regions have a very high amplitude. So for, we had a lot of spikes in our study. So this became a proxy measure for spike and wave discharges with higher value indicating a more severe uh, epileptogenic discharge. So, uh, so we know the spikes that are coming from epileptogenic regions have a higher value than the spikes that are coming from the spike propagation area. So high value of phase amplitude coupling would indicate a primary epileptogenic region and a lower value would indicate a secondary epileptogenic region that which might not require resection. Limitations. Uh, so it's a retrospective study. There are a small number of patients. Uh, Subtemporal electrodes were used instead of depth electrodes, but uh, studies show that they are both effective in evaluating hippocampal epileptogenicity, as well as there were some methodological limitations from the software. So in conclusion, MRI normal epileptogenic hippocampus shows increase in rate of spikes, HFO occurring with spikes, and phase amplitude coupling while MRI normal non-epileptogenic hippocampus shows a paradoxical increase in HFO. 
So uh, from our findings, uh, we find that even in difficult to treat epilepsy patients who do not want to undergo chronic evaluation, we can augment the biomarkers using sevoflurane, uh, which can help decide whether to resect or spare a MRI normal hippocampus. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Now, can we call upon Dr. Prakash to, pre uh, to present the paper, please? Uh, good morning. I'm Dr. Prakash Tesla, second year FCPS resident from Onupra Neural Institute. Today I will be talking on morphometric analysis of posterior fossa in individuals with highly one month duration and review of literature. These are my surveillings. There are no disclosures regarding this study. Starting off with this introduction, the Kyrie one malformation consists of four types of hindbrain abnormalities. The majority of uh, Kyrie malformation are type one or type two, with very limited number of the uh, cases comprising the remaining types. Kyrie one malformations or primary cerebral ectopias or the adult Kyrie malformations are heterogeneous group of conditions with underlying commonality of disruption of normal series of flow uh, through the foramen magnum. They are classically described as a rare abnormalities is restricted to caudal displacement of cerebellum with transfer of foundation below the foramen magnum. This, however, have gone through a number of reconsiderations. Classically, more than 5 mm is defined as clearly pathologic, with 3 to 5 mm being borderline. Syringomyelia of the spinal cord is present in 30 to 70 percent of the cases. It could be the result of overcrowding within a primarily small and shallow posterior fossa, most probably due to underdeveloped occipital bone. The objective of the study is to measure posterior fossa dimension in individuals with Kyrie 1 malformation to better understand its etiopathogenesis and correlate findings with the current literature in the era of the high definition MRI. These are the parameters measured. Now moving on to materials and methods. Total 29 case, uh, cases underwent surgery for type 1 carry malformation between the years January 2019 to September 2022. All had transfer foundation of 5 mm or larger. Of those, 15 cases were included and 14 excluded. The only uh, criteria of the exclusion was unavailability of the, the soft copy of MRI, either because MRI was done at other center or the DICOM file format was not retrievable. The control group was selected from individuals who underwent MRI of brain for complaints of headaches with no significant findings, uh, amazing findings. Total of 15 individuals were selected, age and sex matched with the cases. It is a retrospective case control study. Images were images obtained from Simon's Magnetum 3T MRI scanner and processed in Vasis Tricom Viewer. The length of the clibus was measured from uh, top of dorsum cell to the basion. AB diameter of the foramen magnum was uh, measured from the basion to the office theon. Length of supraocciput was measured from the office theon to the uh, midpoint of the internal occipital protuberance. AP diameter of the posterior fossa was made, measured from the uh, top of dorsum cellae to the midpoint of uh, internal occipital protuberance. Height of posterior fossa was made, measured from the basion to the uh, peak of tentorium cerebelli. And the angle, for the cerebral, uh, angle of the cerebellar tentorium to the twinning uh, line was measured to estimate the stiffness of the cerebellum. Statistical analysis was performed using IBM SPS software version 25 for the windows. Values of all parameters measured for cases and control groups assessed by pair t test. And significance was indicated by two, ta uh, two tail p value of less than 0 0.05. This is the tabulation of my data. Amongst the cases, 67% were female and 33% were male. And in the control group, 60% were female and 40% were male. Many other literatures have also revealed that female patients outnumber the male patient. Uh, in uh, chiral malformation cases. The mean of age in uh, cases uh, was 36.3 years and that of controls is 33.8 years. The most common present complaints uh, was limb weakness followed by neck pain, gait imbalance, headache, and radiculopathy. The duration of onset of symptoms prior to presenting to hospital was two months, uh, ranged from two months to 14 years. Syringomyelia was present in 13 out of the 15 cases. Now moving on to the results, the mean of length of clivus in cases uh, was 36.6 y 
And in control, it was 41.18. The p-value of 0.010, the difference in the mean is significant. The mean of epidiameter of foramen magnum increases 35.31. In control, 30.64. With p-value of 0.02, the difference in the mean is significant. The mean of length of supraocciput in cases subgroup was 35.54, and in control 39.85 with p-value of 0.047, which shows statistical significance. Height of post shift fossa in uh, cases 38.67, and in control 44.60 with the p-value of 0 .09, uh, 0.09, which is statistically significant. Anterior posterior diameter of post shift fossa in cases was 79.72, and in the control it was 80.13. The p-value of 0 0.869, which is not significant statistically. The tentorial angle in uh, uh, cases was 30.08 degrees, and in control, it was 32.41 degrees, with a p-value of 0 0.170, which is also not significant statistically. So to conclude, the length of the clivus, length of the supraocciput, and the height of the posterior fossa was shorter in uh, carry one malformation individuals as compared to healthy individuals. And the difference in the mean, mean value is significant. The AP diameter of the foramen ma magnum is larger in carry one month individuals as compared to the healthy individuals, and the difference is significant. The AP diameter of the posterior fossa was shorter, and the tentorial angle was steeper in carry one month individuals. However, the statistical significance could not be obtained. Now, moving on to the discussion part. Uh, this study corroborates findings of multiple studies which state that carry one malformation is most likely produced by underdevelopment of occipital enchondrium, possibly due to underdevelopment of the occipital somites originating from paraxial mesoderm. Uh, the, this hypology of the posterior fossa results in hornation of the normal size hindbrain. There are no uh, anomalies of neural structures involved. This hornation results in the broadening of the anterior posterior diameter from in magnum. The hornation of the cerebellar tonsils from the primary magnum into spinal canal results in obstruction of the anatomical pathway of the CSF circulation, which can result in the development of the hydrocephalus. It has been also demonstrated that the blockade of the intracranial and intraspinal subarachnoid space is one of the most important causes for the development of syringomyelia. Uh, there is upward shifting of the contents due to overcrowding of the posterior fossa, along with the downward shifting of the hindbrain, which leads to the steeper tentorium. In this uh, meta-analysis published in uh, 2020, data was obtained from 12 studies, which comprise a total four and 21 cases from all over the world uh, between the years 1990 to 2019. It concluded that there is smaller measurement of clivus, supraoccipital bone, and posterior fossa diamonds in patients with carry malformation compared with normal subjects. And they also uh, uh, suggest that the surgical treatment of uh, carry malformation should consider a smaller dimension of the posterior fossa in planning. There is also an alternative narrative put forward by Professor Goyal regarding the etiopathogenesis of the Kairi malformation, or as the author would like to call the Kairi formation. This paper series analyzed surgical outcomes of 388 patients managed via atlantic axial fixation without posterior fossa decompression. And the author concluded that the atlantic axial instability is the nodal point of pathogenesis of Kairi 1 malformation, and it may just be secondary to natural neural alteration in the face of instability. So to conclude, uh, with a small number of sample cases, it was demonstrated that there is disparity in dimension of posterior fossa between Kairi malformation 1 individual and healthy individuals. Posterior fossa is underdeveloped in Kairi 1 malformation, leading to crowding of the neural structures containing within, uh, uh, resulting in herniation. Posterior fossa decompression is the most widely accepted modality of management of carry uh, malformation, and which is which we also follow in our institute. Several prospective analysis of cases treated by multiple surgeons at and at multiple institutions is mandatory to answer emerging hypotheses. These are the limitations of this study. The references. Thank you. So you said uh, your the reason for the Chiari is smaller posterior fossa. Yes, sir. But uh, in your study, both the control and the study did not have a significant difference in any of the diameters. How do you uh, conclude your study? Uh, it it can be attributed to smaller sample size as well, sir. If we increase the sample size, then we can uh, possibly obtain the significance statistically. There is a difference, however, it was not significant statistically. 
the increase in the sample size might uh, alter the results. Thank you, Prabhas. Uh, uh, finally, can we call open Dr. Jessica Kayasta, please? She is pres uh, presenting on surgical outcome of anti and posterior circulation aneurysms, a single center study. Namaskar and good morning, everyone. I am Dr. Jessica Kaiste, FCPS resident neurosurgery from Annapurna Neurological Institute and Allied Sciences. And the topic of my presentation today is surgical outcomes of anterior and posterior circulation aneurysms, a single center study. And I have no uh, conflicts to disclose. So cerebrovascular diseases, these have remained among the world's leading cause of death for many years. Although aneurysmal subarachnoid hemorrhage is not ranked among the most frequent cerebrovascular diseases, it has one of the highest morbidity and mortality rates that ranges between 23% to 51%. So there are multiple sociodemographic, clinical, radiological, and healthcare-related factors that have associated with poor outcome in aneurysmal subarachnoid hemorrhage. And identifying the variables that are associated with poor outcomes in our settings, it would help us develop and implement more effective treatment strategies focused on preventing and managing these factors. So the aim of this study is to report our experience uh, of microsurgical clipping for ruptured uh, anterior and posterior circulation aneurysm. And we aim to study the outcome in terms of morbidity and mortality in patients who underwent microsurgical clipping of aneurysm. So we did a retrospective cohort study from January 2020 to December 2021. We had 111 aneurysm surgeries. It was conducted at Department of Neurosurgery on Napuna Neurological Institute and Allied Sciences, and it was approved by IRC. So we had a patient with uh, ruptured and unruptured aneurysms who underwent surgical intervention uh, that were included in the study. The medical and imaging records for all the patients were reviewed. The data was retrieved from electronic medical ar uh, record archives and the patient outcome was determined by modified ranking scale MRS at the time of discharge and at three months interval. So data was collected in Microsoft Excel and it was analyzed uh, in SPSS. Categorical variables were expressed as frequencies and percentages. Results were categorized into functional outcome that was good or poor outcome as per modified ranking scale. Data was summarized in means and standard deviation. man whitney u test was applied for continuous variable while Fisher exact and chi-square test for categorical variables. So bivariate analysis was done to see association between the variables or uh, between uh, association of different variables with functional outcome and statistically significant variable from bivariate analysis. Those having p-value less than 0 0.05 were included in multivariate analysis to find out the predictors of outcome. So we had the patients ranging from age nine years to 81 years with a mean age of 51.68 plus minus 14.43 standard deviation. And in the chart, you can see most of the patient uh, in whom we did surgeries uh, lies in 40 years to 70 years age group. With female, female uh, predominance, 73% of the patient in our study were female and 27 of them were 27% were male. And here we can see 18.92% uh, of the patient had history of alcohol consumption, 43.24% had history of smoking, and 45.94% had history of hypertension. So among all the surgeries that I have been talking about, 90% of them were anterior circulation aneurysm. And most common among them were ACOM aneurysm, accounting for 33%, and that was followed by MC aneurysm, that is 29%. And 10% of those aneurysm surgeries were posterior circulation aneurysm, and among them, PICA aneurysm was most common. So among all the surgeries, 93.69% of them were clipping. We had three coiling done with flow diverter, two wrapping, one trapping, and one proximal ligation with ECIC high flow bypass. In some of the cases, we also had done intraoperative CSF drainage. In 15 cases, we kept LP drain. In 10, we kept EVD. 
And uh, following the surgery, there were some post-operative complications that we had to deal with. 14.41% uh, had chest infection, 7.2% of the patient had prolonged intubation by various reasons, and they subsequently landed with tracheostomy. And 3.6% uh, of the patient had massive infarction leading to decompressive craniectomy. We had only one post-surgical bleed, and there was 11.71% of hydrocephalus for which we had uh, shunt surgery done. So despite of the aggressive treatment and management of the complications in the surgeries, we had in-hospital mortality of 13.5%, and overall survival was 86.5%. So the results were categorized into functional outcome, either good outcome or poor outcome as modified rank and scale, and we had 72% of good outcome in our case. So comparing in the outcome at the time of discharge and at three months interval, uh, there was 12.9% of the patient who progressed to good outcome at three months interval. We did bivariate analysis of variables on the outcome at the time of discharge and at three months. So here are the data, and we can see there are certain variables like hypertension, alcohol, GCS at the time of presentation, CSF drain intraoperatively, Hunt and Hess, and modified Miller Fisher, which were statistically significant. Similarly, we did it in at a three months interval as well, and here also we can see similar variables that are statistically significant. So it concludes that bivariate analysis, it showed statistically significant association of hypertensive patient, alcohol intake, poor GCS at time of presentation, poor Hunt and Hayes and modified Miller Fisher score with poor outcome with a p-value of less than 0.05. So those variables which were statistically significant uh, in bivariate analysis was further put on for multivariate analysis. Multivariate logistic regression analysis, it showed that uh, the variables like hypertension, mod, uh, GCS at the time of presentation, Hunt and Hayes and modifi modified miller pieces are independent factors that leads to good, uh, good or poor outcome. So discussing all the statistics that I have mentioned, with female predominance, most of the aneurysms clipped were ecomaneurysm, in, including the giant and complex aneurysms. In this graph, we can clearly see high Hunt and Hayes and modified Miller Fisher is directly proportional to uh, high morbidity and mortality in such patients. And the next thing is placement, placement of EVD drain in our setup has not led to good outcome in comparison to those who had LP drain placed. So in my opinion, I think uh, placing an EVD is not a good idea. And uh, if needed, then we can go for LP drain. So uh, having talked about all this, uh, for the last few days, we have been enjoying a lot in Pokhara. We have been taking a lot of beer and alcohol and tequila and whatsoever. But it's sad to say that outcome was not satisfactory in those who consume alcohol. So there were many studies, and I have put uh, two of them. These uh, studies also conclude the similar thing that I have been telling. The predictors of unfavorable outcome includes high Hunt and Hiss grade, aneurysm re-rupture, re unsecured aneurysm, and increased systolic blood pressure or heart rate. So while talking so much about aneurysm, how can we not talk about vasospasm? We all know what is vasospasm, but I have not included that in my presentation because in my statistics, because this was a retrospective study and looking on all the paperwork, we, are, we were not so confident whether the patient really had vasospasm or not. So this was one of the limitations in my study. But in all the cases, what we did was either we did early surgery or we waited for two weeks prior surgery in order to avoid vasospasm. In all, and all the patient, they received 0.9% normal saline solution at 1 ml per kg per hour to raise central venous pressure to 5 mm of Ag. Standard treatment included nemodipine, paracetamol, and AED in post-hemorrhagic states and uh, laxatives as usual. And patient with hydrocephalus, they underwent ventricular shunt implantation. And 111, that is the number of the patient that we kept in uh, our study. And yesterday, we heard a very good presentation by Dr. Mohammed Anwar Chaudhary. He presented very beautifully 180 cases of the uh, 180 aneurysm cases in uh, 2.5 years in 500 bedded hospital. And this is the number uh, that we studied in two year interval in 50 bedded hospital. That is quite a big number 13.5%. That is a mortality, and uh, most of the neurosurgeons here will be questioning me. 13.5%, it is really acceptable. I cannot say it is acceptable, but what I can say is we have a variety of range of uh, uh, types of aneurysms that we are uh, dealing in day-to-day -day activities. That ranges from simple ACOM aneurysm, 
simple MC aneurysms that is very uh, simple and easy for most of the neurosurgeons here. But most of the uh, uh, aneurysms we deal are uh, the huge and complex giant aneurysms. For the residents like us, it is really uh, disturbing and we uh, like, uh, we are confused whether it is tumor or it is aneurysm in the first glance. So we have we are dealing with such aneurysms, daily huge aneurysms, and uh, such aneurysms which we were firstly uh, uh, confused with the meningioma, and also multiple aneurysm in a single patient. This was a patient who underwent uh, pecum left-sided pecum aneurysm uh, 14 years back, and now she presented with three aneurysms uh, simultaneously. That is acum aneurysm, MC aneurysm, and pecum aneurysm, and we clipped all of them. So to conclude, surgical outcome of microsurgical flipping of aneurysm in terms of MRS at three months is accept with acceptable mortality. And however, more studies with comparative group is needed for better analysis and conclusion. So factors like poor GCS at presentation, high hunt and SS modified uh, Miller Fisher grade, massive SAS with interventricular extension is associated with poor outcome. Smoking being one of the contributing factors of aneurysm that can be avoided and brain check, which I was emphasizing in last year in my presentation as well, it can be the modern tool to diagnose aneurysm prior rupture. And we know early intervention prior rupture leads to better outcome. So these are my limitations and references. Thank you. Jessica. Nice presentation. You. you said in uh, your ca four cases you had who had cardiac diseases, yeah. right? So what was the, you see, the character or type of aneurysm in those cases? Uh, in uh, those cases who had card cardiac abnormalities, there were uh, quite simple aneurysms, like uh, two of them had ACOM aneurysm and two of them had MC aneurysm, and which was not included in those giant aneurysms. It was quite simple aneurysm. That Is there had. any association of, you see, the congenital heart disease and the aneurysm? Is there any association? Yes, so we can find in many literatures that there is association of cardiac disease what, with... What association? Uh, what type of aneurysm they get if they have congenital cardiac disease? Uh, most of the congenital cardiac disease land up to mycotic aneurysms. Yeah. So we have a nine-year-old child who had a mycotic aneurysm which we operated. Right. Good. And other yes. thing is, you said in 15 cases you put the lumbar in. Yes, sir. For hydrocephalus probably, right? And in your institute, is there any, you see, the trying to do the fenestration of lamina terminalis while doing anterior circulation aneurysm, which can, which can resolve the hydrocephalus and they may not need the shunt post-operatively. Yes, sir. Do we, you practice or not? Yes, sir. We do practice that as well. Therefore, in 86 number of the patients, we did not keep any uh, CSF diversion. Only in 10 and 15 cases, we did that. So in most of the cases, we don't keep the CSF. So what was the indication for lumbar drain? So uh, most of the cases are where uh, we get the cases in emergency are ruptured aneurysm with increased intracranial pressure. So while going inside, uh, we really think to make the uh, brain light and then uh, that will be a great environment to work inside. So uh, in such cases where the brain is really tight, we uh, tend to put on EVD or LP drain. Thank you. Oh, oh, thank you. Actually, you were saying that you know putting a EVD is not good. I think that's one of the slides. Yes. Actually, in my practice, I never put a lumbar drain. I mean, in more than two hundred cases, two fifty cases, I've never put a lumbar drain. If needed, you put a you know at a pine's point, you can take a EVD and put it if it's needed. Otherwise. I usually don't put a lumbar tree. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. We'll uh, conclude the our session. Thank you very much. Uh, I just want to comment about hydrocephalus. Usually, it is the communicating type of hydrocephalus because mixing of the blood leads uh, to the increased amount of proteins. So, if there is hydrocephalus significantly, then uh, we patient should be stayed with on. We should not go for EVD. EVD, of course, has uh, the. Um, uh, is, um, uh, so, the, uh, uh, we should avoid the putting the drains. Uh, 
external vacuum drain because it has too high incidence of infections. So shunt is preferred over the uh, drains. Thank you. Thank you, doctors, for inspiring us with your line of work and to see what everyone else has seen, but to think what nobody else has thought. With this, we've come to the third session of the day, the plenary session, and may I have the pleasure to invite on the dais Dr. Mohammed Anwar Chaudhary and Dr. Amit Thapa. So may I request you to take the front row seats, please. Thank you. Thank you. Well, uh, this is a very important session for this particular meeting. It's a SARC symposium very, where we are going to discuss on how to adapt dissemination of neurosurgical services in our countries. Well, uh, just to let all of you know, know here that we are running short behind time, and that's why we request all these speakers to please stick to your timeline. Uh, so without any further ado, uh, let me first invite the first speaker, Professor VP Singh. So your talk. He will be speaking on education initiatives of NSI. Morning, everybody. Greeting once again to the Dr. Right here in the And uh, we are having a partner here. This being on. Being a marketing meeting, and it's actually been my pleasure and honor to present here at this historic 10th meeting, which has many first initiated by Praveen and his team. And the words and I are very happy to be part of the meeting. I think this is the landmark where the Medicine Stable Surgery has really blossomed and is now ready, it's already taken off. But it's very, very far. So, good night. Yeah. So, let me tell you a bit about the Neurological Society of India. It started in 1951, where four members, Dr. Jacob Chandy, Dr. B. Ramamurthy, Dr. Bandev Singh, and Dr. Narasimhan, they sat down for dinner in Chennai and then decided to form a society. Very ambitious, as neurosurgeons always are. Four members wanted to have a society and decided to have a meeting. And the meeting, the first meeting was held within three months in Hyderabad on the 3rd of March, 1952, attended by 30 members. And the presentation addressed by Dr. Jacob Chandy was Neurology Comes of Age. Subsequently, in the beginning, they said the main objective is education. And therefore, they decided to form a journey, which was called neurology. And, you know, subsequently, because neurology was already existing, they changed it to neurology. And uh, very soon, initially, the meetings were held with the Association of Physicians of India. But in 1964, they decided to have independent meetings. And the first independent meeting was held in 1964. As education was an important initiative, the main initiative, they decided to have a continuing medical education program as, part, as the first day of the meeting. And this was one of the first super speciality societies in India to have a CME program. So, because of the increasing number of education and activities, which is the primary objective of a society, it was decided that the EC often is busy with other administrative measures. So a board of education was constituted about 10 years ago, which was nominated by the EC, which would look after all the educational matters of the uh, education and activities of the NSI, except for the annual meeting. And this is now doing standard work. Uh, so very early we felt that the students who are going for exams 
are often they face the first exam during, you know, they're, they're the first time when they enter the exam, that is they have a new system of examination. That's the first time they face it. So we decided to have instruction and courses where mock exams would be taken and, you know, the people would get exposure. And this was started in 2020. It occurs twice a year and is a very popular move. We have about 30 to 35 students, final year students who are allowed to come. And a full exam is conducted so that the examiners, the examinees know what exactly to expect in the main exam and they can perform better. In addition, we felt that first year students, trainees, they, they are totally lost. You know, they don't have any orientation to neuro. And they gradually learn over the next six months to one year. So to jumpstart them, another initiative was started by NSI called the Foundation Course in 2015. This again is held twice a year. We limit it to 30 residents. And uh, they, they are given an exposure to the basics of neurosurgery, how to position a patient, what are the coagulation uh, techniques, you know, basic hemostatic techniques, basic things which they need to do on a day-to-day -day basis, neurological examination. So this way we try to cover as many people as possible, as many members of a society as possible to make it all inclusive. Then it was felt that with the expansion of neurosurgery and many uh, specializations which have come in, and all centers would not be having all the facilities. There may be centers which don't do DBS or they which don't do radio surgery. So we decided to have a super speciality CME. And this is held in a subtopic or a super specialization. Only people who are allowed to attend are neurosurgeons who have completed their training and under the age of 45, preferably under the age of 40. So this was started in 2016. This is held once a year, and these are the topics which we've held. The last one was held in August on minimally invasive spine. This again is held in a totally educational atmosphere. Spouses are not involved and out to attend, so that everybody stays in the hall, and they are very well attended. And uh, this is something, all these three activities that we have for the younger members are fully sponsored. The students, the residents, the junior faculty do not spend a single rupee. We charge them a registration fee so as to check their commitment. And people who attend the course, the fee is refunded. People who don't attend the course, who waste the seat, we don't refund the fees. But we are happy that we are able to generate enough funds from our sponsors to do all this totally free. Then we have a lot of online activities and this really took a boost during the COVID. When we could not meet physically, we wanted to keep the activities of the society going. So we have a number of uh, things that we have initiated. And this is a virtual OR series, which has been uh, started, which occurs uh, twice a month. These are just the recent activities. And uh, someone who sort of done these things, who's an expert in these, he takes the class and he takes the students step by step, showing videos, showing the activities, how to do it. And, you know, you can see the type of topics which are covered. Then there are a lot of webinars which are happening. And as you can see, we have about two to three webinars every month. And these are of various types. You have master classes, you have lectures, you have case based discussions, we have uh, journal clubs, anatomy things. Then we have collaborative symposia with the Indian Academy of Neurology or the Neuropathology. With the CNS, we've had some uh, combined things. And, uh, you know, these things are happening every alternate week or every week to try to increase the involvement of the students. They usually run for about one and a half hours in the evening on a Friday or Wednesday evening and try to keep the things active. But I must say now a webinar fatigue is setting in and people are longing to get back to physical conferences, which is what is going to happen. We also have an exam program, online quiz program 
for residents, which you're having once a month for exam going residents. And this is something which is a very interesting initiative called current practices in neurosurgery. One controversial topic from neurosurgery is examined. Then we give it to about uh, three or four people who are experts in the field. They sit down, talk together, sift through all the evidence that they have and come out with a status set of statement which tells us, okay, this for this topic, this is what we know. This is where we are. These are the shortcomings. And this is the current practice guidelines. So these are the type of topics that you see. We bring it out uh, once every two months. But topics which are of day-to-day -day interest to the students. So this is the CPINs for the last, for the current year. And this, of course, all of you are aware of is our flagship. This is what we are really proud of, our journal, which has been there since the beginning. It's come out very well. We get contributions from all over the world. We have a long waiting list. Somebody mentioned yesterday about getting research published. We are happy to say we've taken a conscious decision not to charge because we are purely an academic. The purpose is purely academic. We don't want to make money out of the journal. In fact, a major chunk of our expenditure in a year is on the journal. But we think that that is worthwhile because this is our showcase to the world. This is what where we showcase our residence work, our faculty work. And this has a good impact factor. It's just doing very extremely well. And uh, we also have a video uh, library on. So it's not just printed. You can submit a video, a technique for presentation, for publication, and the videos are there so that people can access it anytime. It's a free access journal. Anybody can access it. The CPINs, the current practices, is also on this website, the Neurology India website. And I would urge all of you to look at it and take, you know, take benefit from it. Every year when we have the CME along with the annual conference, uh, that is the best attended part of the whole conference. And we bring out a booklet every year, a book which gives you the topic so that you can take back a copy with you. And of course, the NSI con, the annual conference, this is open to all of you. The next conference is in uh, Agra from the 7th to 11th of December. It's a big meeting. We, it's a meeting where there is education, there are social activities, and most importantly, a place to renew our friendships, to meet old friends, to have a camaraderie of our colleagues and have fun and education at the same time. I must say that for all the SARC countries, we treat them as equivalent to Indian delegates and we don't charge them extra. It's the same fees. The foreigners, of course, pay more, but you are part of us and we are very happy to take things forward and partner I think what we have to realize is that our subcontinent, the problems are similar. You and I face the same problems of, you know, no middle income status countries where the facilities are restricted, where epilepsy is common, MTS is common, our, you know, the spina bifida is common. So our problems are similar. Tuberculosis is there. The solutions are not going to come from the best. When we started epilepsy surgery, when I came back from training, I said, well, there's no way we can start an NG. But as we started, we realized there are a lot of things that we can do. We have to customize the protocols. Basant has done the same here. And he's been so successful. So we cannot blindly ape the West. While we can look at them for direction, for inspiration, but ultimately, we even have to find the solutions to our problems. And our problems are common. And that is why collaboration between our societies is the way forward. We learn from each other. The meeting here has been very educative. It's been really good. I've enjoyed it extremely well. And I think we can all learn from each other. Our courses are open for you. 
Many of you are welcome to attend. Let us move forward in a spirit of collaboration and take our countries forward. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, sir. That was a very uh, good presentation on education initiatives. And uh, we really commend the uh, Neurological Society of India to take a lot of initiative. I could see that recently there are a lot of new things which has been introduced. And definitely education is one sector where even Nesson is also striving its uh, foot forward. And this particular meeting is still uh, a, a clear example of what uh, we are trying to bring out of the valley. Uh, in in uh, our sense, Nepal Journal of Neurosciences, uh, NJNS, is also doing well, and it usually publishes all the papers free of cost. And we have a lot of submissions which are received from all over the country. So that's, again, a way to, to commend uh, the work which is being done outside uh, the capital in the, in the different hospitals across the nations. Uh, so education is definitely a way to go forward in disseminating the services. Thank you once again, sir, and thank you for encouraging words. Yeah, I've been a visitor to Nepal for a long time, from the initial period, and I've seen the tremendous progress. I think you're world class now. We just have to try. That's it. So, thank you. Great. Thank you, sir. Now, let me invite uh, Professor Pavan Kumar Sultania, a uh, living legend, uh, to talk on dissemination of neurosurgical services in Nepal. Thank you, Chairpersons, for asking me to present the paper. And uh, I'm very much uh, thankful to the nation for asking me to present the paper and got an opportunity to present at this <clears throat> mega platform. And actually, the topic assigned to me was not the Nepal, it was the SAD. But certainly, it will include the uh, Nepal chapter also, because we already heard Professor V.P. Singh, the educational activities in India, and Professor V.P. Singh has been my teacher also. So, we, we understand. Now, <clears throat> the topic is the dissemination of neurosurgical services experience and efforts in South countries. Next, please. So, my plan would be about the neurosurgical dissemination and why should I keep the requirement? Why should I uh, put the requirements over there? Because requirements is very much required for the sense that how many neurosurgeons, how many hospitals do we need? So requirements is there. So I have put that also in my plan. And then the evolution of the neurosurgery or rather the dissemination of the surgery uh, abroad and then to the Nepal. So how did it come? And the, the dissemination is an ongoing process that is in the agriculture, that is in the trading everywhere. So we shall be focusing on the neurosurgery itself only. And then the eventually last the perspective in the <clears throat> South Asian Neurosurgical Congress. Next, please. So what does the dissemination stands for? It's a Oxford meaning. We already know it's just for the completion of the factual, that action or facts of the spreading something, especially information widely is the disseminations. And these are the various methods of the, <clears throat> or tools for the dissemination. Out of that, we already know every, but in last two to three years, the webinar or the virtual meetings has really, <clears throat> increased like anything and during the uh, COVID period so much so that every weekly the nation was conducting the webinars and that was quite useful also but as the activity started that activity has reduced and on top of that uh, we have to understand that to provide the service there are three stakeholders in it one is the um, um, hospitals or the institutions. Second is the service provider like we neurosurgeons and third is the public. 
So public awareness program is also very much important until unless we do that, they, we can hear that every day there is some sort of the grumbling and some sort of the um, unpleasant events is going on in many of the hospitals. And that is also very much important. And that is, that is being also taken care. I will just say <clears throat> another. And the next, please. So this is a group, Journal of the Neurosurgery Publishing Group, established a social media team in 2016 with the name of the Brain Book. And they are doing a quite of look, a lot, uh, just the public awareness about the neurosurgical services, how it is going on. And it has been found that it has really minimized the grumbling and the unpleasant events in many of the institutions. So I think in Eson or the uh, SARC, uh, can do that sort of the or run that that is being there, there but it has to be institutionalized so that more and more public awareness or counseling can reduce the unnecessary uh, events which is going on in many of the institutions and we are the one uh, very much victims of that mostly because corporate house do have the uh, I mean victimizations but it's the we we suffer more Next, please. So this is a global scenario of the requirements. Where is the... I'm... Yeah. So every year, we know that this is a slide which has been shared by Professor Mohan Sarma. And this is the global scenario that every year more than 22 million people suffer from the neurosurgical disorder. And out of that, 13.8 million require surgery. But the hard part is that more than 5 million do not get the surgical service which is required. As there is, neurotrauma procedures are considered the baseline. So it must be pro provided to everybody. But somehow we are lacking in that and that we have to boost up our services, our training to uh, provide the services to the public in this regard. Next, please. So there is an aim by 2030, there has to be 80% coverage of the services. Still, we shall be lacking 20% of the services, but 20, 80% is the, and the aim is that the, all the neurosurgical patients must reach within to the center within four hours of the incidents so that key, they can attain the maximum outcome or better outcome. And if it is delayed that all of us know, if it is more than four hours, certainly outcome is not so better as it is done within the four hours. So that is the aim which has been folks. And for that, what is the adequate workforce essential? That is one of the most essential component. So what is the adequate most social required? So adequate, adequate means okay, what is the wait times in all, all of the institutions, like in the uh, NAMS, there is a wait time of the three months. Maybe in the Institute of Medicine, wait time is four months. Well, the manpower is there, but the number of the beds are very much constrained. And that is the reason the wait time is too much high. And certainly that is exhaustive to the patients. So we have to reduce the wait times, like the surgical volumes, how many are being done. Uh, and like in the Anpurna, they are doing about 2,500 per annum. So that's quite a good number of the surgery that is being done. So that we have to increase. But what is the requirement in the country itself that we have to assess? So that we can assess very easily. So, and again, the many of the hospitals do not want to imply the neurosurgeons. The reason behind may be the cost, maybe the return. There are so many things. As a neurosurgeons, we just think of the providing the service to do for the best for the patients. But that is not the priority of the hospitals, especially the private hospitals, also the government hospitals. They also don't prioritize employment. So basically, there is requirement of the one neurosurgeon per 100,000 of the populations. So that is the basic requirements. And where do we stand in this scenario that we shall, I shall discuss in the next slide. So currently, global density is that is just the 30% of the requirement. Next, please. 
So it has been estimated that average 250 surgeries can be performed by a neurosurgeon. So that is there and that is. But I remember in the B hospital, because there were only two or three neurosurgeons, so we had to perform about 500 or more than 500 neurosurgery <clears throat> every year. So that was the there, but certainly now it will come to the, so to perform a better, uh, to provide the best uh, neurosurgical service, we have to reduce the number, but certainly it, de it depends on the uh, work volume itself. So that is the overall because and one neurosurgeon and for the TBI, the requirement is about one neurosurgeon for the two lakhs of the population. Next please. So after talking about the requirements, I shall tell a little bit of the how the dissemination started of the neurosurgery from the global. So it was Mr. Berman, Berman who published the first textbook of the neurosurgery on the nervous system. So that is about 150 years before that is there. And we all know about the brocage area and the role of the brocage area and the uh, sufferings of aphasic patients also. So there is nothing much has to be uh, told about the brocage. And then uh, McMinn was the one who excited meningioma and did the laminectomy, recorded one. Maybe there are many craniotomies and laminectomies done before, but the recorded one is the about uh, 1879 and the 1883. And like the Victor Housley, though he was a new uh, general surgeon, but he was very much interested in the neurosurgery. So he started and there is a ward uh, in one of the hospital in England with the name of the Victor Housley. And he was the one who uh, trained the uh, father of the neurosurgery, what we call nowadays. Next, please. So in the modern era, the father of the neurosurgery is called the Mr. Cushing. And the warden, both are the contemporary at the same time, and they were trained. And then they took the disseminated the knowledge from Europe or uh, trans transatlantic to the uh, USA. And he contributed a lot to the neurosurgery, and that is immense. And certainly, it, we have to remember it always. Next, please. So, from that, the, how the neurosurgery started in Nepal, although Mr. Gangol's name is being spoken in many of the meetings, it has to be because we have we should not forget the history also. So Mr. Gangol was the one who did the craniotomy first, and he carried the skill of the craniotomy from uh, Professor Gajendra Singh from the Bomb Bombay because he was uh, he had his thesis on the hydrocephalus, and there he carried the no skill of that, and he did it there. And, and in 1980 or 78, Professor Damodar Parajuli uh, came from the UK after a four or five years of the neurosurgical training, and he started in the Army Hospital. Next. So these are the hospitals who had the infrastructure to start the neurosurgery, although craniotomy was done in 1962. But in 1980 only, we could have a uh, neurosurgical ward with the beds and the OPD attendants, and, uh, but the, uh, there was the lack of the OT, uh, operating rooms were very less. So the, they assigned the OT after 2 p.m. only. And Army Hospital, I don't remember well, but Professor Mathai from the CMC Bellore used to come for two, three years continuing for one month or two months on a basis and he used to teach the neurosurgery. Uh, uh, my um, technique of the neurosurgery in Nepal he started and as a medical officer, Professor U.P. Devkota was working with him uh, to prepare the cases for the operations and everything. So at that time, uh, Professor Devkota developed the interest in the neurosurgery. Subsequently, he became the neurosurgeon and he started the neurosurgery later on. Next, please. So this is the national demography, just to show the population is 30 million. They recently we finished our census and the per capita income, it was 700 something dollar uh, last time and it has jumped to the about 1,035 area is there. The health budget, I remember when I joined the job, it was about 3% of the 
total budget. Now it has jumped to the 9%. It has increased. But out of the 9%, I see that hardly um, 60 or 70% of that is spent in the health sector. Rest is somehow remains free. Next, please. <clears throat> So what is the neurosurgical populations? We have already talked about the world, Europe, USA. In Nepal, it is 273 for uh, population. One neurosurgeon is the 273. So that is already 30% of the requirements. And we can see the speed at which we are training. It will take another uh, two decades to full, fulfill the requirements. Until and unless we speed up fast, probably that may be possible to compensate, but still 20 years is required. Next, please. So this is again a study done at the IOM, and we show that there is more and more interest is being developed in among the MBBS about the neurosurgery, maybe different, maybe a uh, money making or maybe a, some recognition, whatever aim is there, but interest is there. So that's good sign for, to get the candidates for the training. Next, please. Oh, <laughs> anyhow, next, please. So these are the four hospitals, which I'm putting photographs. Names I already talked about. TUTS developed the neurosurgical department in 1995 and the army in 1980. And currently in the valley, more than 20 hospitals are having the neurosurgical services. And it is focused, about 70% of the neurosurgeons are focused in the valley itself. So certainly more, we have to go in the periphery. And the outside valley, more than 25 is still there. When I joined the, usually all the patients used to come uh, from all over the Nepal to the Beer Hospital because that was the only center available at that time. But now it is there and it is a very good, because that was a dream at that time that we are going to have some peripheral conference also. And it gives me immense pleasure that after 25 years of that, we could organize one of the Nestone conference in Pokhara. And that will keep on continue in days to come. Uh, that is to disseminate the knowledge all around. And now a very few number of the patients travel abroad to have the service, except as Professor uh, VP Singh told for the personal interest, if somebody wants to go somewhere, it's all right. Only technology or the equipments which we are lacking currently is the cyber knife or the gamma knife. Otherwise, more or less all the techniques are available in the country itself. So it doesn't need any patient to go abroad. Next, please. And as the education was concerned, uh, Professor Vipsing talked very vividly what the NSI is doing. And Prakash was the first MCH from NAMS and the Maya was the first from the uh, teaching. And these are, I still see that only four uh, hospitals are running this program. Of course, this time Nina's could not have a uh, enrolled candidate or residence. Otherwise, uh, on College of Medical Sciences also probably could not get one or I, I don't know, one, one. Okay. So uh, it is mostly the NAMS and the IOM where the students are there. Yeah. And about 10 to 12 from the, from the international, like the Bangladesh, from the Pakistan, from the uh, China, many are coming. So certainly there is a good number of the residents, or I mean neurosurgeons are joining the uh, galaxy to increase our number. And Nepal Medical Council has started a good trend that the, every surgeon has to have a, they are examined locally to get their license and they have to gain 100 points in five years to continue their license. Next, please. So as a publication and academic, there was a full-fledged lecture here yesterday by Mohan Sarma. There is nothing much to speak about that. He was the one. But the national conference we are organizing annually and this time we are uh, organized outside the valley and internationally every two years cm is monthly and the spinal chapters are also there workshop are few going on every time more or less is being done and the cadaveric is simulation is also going on so these are the activities very much actively now going on next please as far as the society and conferences are the concerns the professor 
UP Devkota was very much interested for the society to form and the conferences. The first society was made, Nepalis Society of the Clinical Neurosciences. Many youngsters may not know why clinical neuroscience, because there were only two neurosurgeons and there was not much of the neurosurgeons at that time. So we had to include the neuroradiologist, neuroanesthesiologist, uh, neurophysiologist to make a society and it was the seven or eight numbers as Professor uh, V.P. Singh told, four in the India, seven in the, that we started and that we conducted a conference in 1999. And that conference was actually not the SAR conference, that was a conference, but subsequently it was considered at the SAR conference and the first SAR conference was organized in Nepal in 1999. And following that, it is going on that I will talk in the next. And the fifth one was again organized in 2012. And there are two another chapters which has been started, neurospine chapters started in the beginning in 2016. Now third or fourth chairperson is already there. And then the another is the neurovascular and currently Professor Oka is the professor person of this neurovascular chapter. So it is continuing. Next, please. Now let us focus, uh, come back to the, with this background, the South Asian Neurosurgical Congress. So, so I already told that the, that was a meeting of the <coughs> Neurosurgical Conference, but it was named as a SAR conference at that time. And then it was established in, and there was a lot of discussions went on in the hall. Uh, who should be the president of uh, SAR conference. And after a long discussion, Professor Tandon proposed that the, the country which held the first meeting should be the president and the next country should be the, it, was, it went alphabetically, the next country should organize the meeting. So it was a chain that way it went on. So uh, first was the Nepal, followed by the Bangladesh subsequently. And in the beginning, there were only seven countries at the time in the SARC. So they were included in that, all participated also. And Afghanistan was not a member of the SARC at that time. So subsequently, Afghanistan became the member of the SARC. Now we have been trying to include that in our uh, Congress also, but somehow it is not properly working. But today I show that somebody is coming from the Afghanistan to present his paper so we can explore this opportunity to include the Afghanistan in our SAR membership. Next, please. So what was the objective at that time in the beginning? It was a very much ambitious objective at that time that the academic exchange, the training and the examination. And these are the three education which Professor V.P. Singh also called upon. So these are the three objectives which we started with these are the things. Next, please. So academic exchange. That is usually at that time until now, of course, whatever is there, till now it is being done by the conferences, webinar, or the symposium, or the CMA. These are the means. So till now, there should be, at least if you remember the 1999 and 22, means uh, uh, 23 years of this establishment. So there should be every two early, two yearly. So it should be 11 or 12 conferences till now. But till now we could organize the only seven conferences. And the next eighth one is going to be organized in Nepal. And uh, more or less all the members have agreed. So next will be there. Training the resident exchange we already saw and it is being done, but it is it still has to be done. I mean systematically and institutionalized. So all the members ex going and coming should be uh, very much through the uh, national <coughs> national um, I mean uh, national society rather than the individual. Individual it is there, but that must be reduced. And the examination was the under consideration in the sense that the aim was to have a single entry and single exit. But I don't think this is possible because of the university and government and so many hurdles and hassles are there. But still, we can think of because in Nepal also the, for the Medical Education Commission, till it was not there, single entry and single exit was not possible. Now it has become possible with single entry. So we can think of in the uh, neurosurgery also. Next, please. So final remarks, 
although efforts have been made for dissemination of neurosurgical services and skills among SARC members, is inadequate and further coordinated efforts is required to attain the goal. Next, please. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next speaker is uh, Dr. Ali Yaf, uh, Hybrid New Services in Maldives. I think it's still good morning. Both arms must together. Thank you for having me. A very good morning to everyone. Um, it's a pleasure to be presenting in the country where I was born as a neurosurgeon. I was taught by Nepalese neurosurgeons. And then uh, it's been eight years since I have started neurosurgery in my country, and it's been a pleasure. So my point, my part of presentation in this one would be how we have progressed and what our future plans are. Uh, I hail from the country which embraces change. Uh, in this picture, what you see is a whole island being supplied, the electrical renewable energy supplied with solar. Our goal in life is to embrace change, go forward. I wish my colleagues from Nepal would come more often to this beautiful nation. We are very fortunate that our government as well as our private sector has been evolving. Uh, this is the place where I am day and night working. The one in the lower corner is my operative theater, which I share with the cardiothoracic surgeon, Dr. Shafi, who also trained from here. And in the upper corner is our biplanar kettle, which we share with the cardiologist, cardiothoracic surgeons. It's an RTZ biplanar machine from Siemens. I wanted to share this video uh, of Professor Spetzler's last aneurysm, which was shown live. And in this one, I hope the video plays. The video. In this video, it shows that he clearly dissects uh, MC aneurysm. Whether deliberately ruptures or in dissection it ruptures, it's not known. But how cleverly he uses his meticulous control if, of his suction, with just one suction, he controls the bleeding and puts an aneurysm clip within two minutes or so. And repositions it two times to a perfect alignment, which might not be there in every neurosurgeon. Going to neurovascular disorders, we have simple to complex aneurysms. We have AVMs of different grades from special Martin grade one to five. We have acute infarcts coming within three hours, six hours, and we have acute coronary stenosis. And we have different morphologies of neurovascular diseases which might not be amenable to just open technique. I, it brings me immense pleasure to remind myself of neurosurgery department of TUTH, where we have a endovascular, uh, we have a craniotomy tray for clipping of aneurysms with multiple different forms of aneurysm clips. Certainly denoting that it's not a simple task. You might not be able to clip, on, clip, a, clip a large aneurysm with different morphology or sizes or orientations with just simple terms, simple clips. There are modifi modifications to clipping, there's wrapping and trapping and so on. And in, in, in fact, we have bypass as well. My point here is it might not be as simple as we think to, de to deliver the best results with just open techniques. 
Hence, necessity brings new inventions. This is where we are looking forward to. In the upper hand corner, you can see stent balloon assisted coiling. The middle one shows embolization of AVMs, stent assisted coilings. We have flow diversions, intrasecular devices, and mechanical thrombectomy. Though it's in the last, it is the most important for any neurosurgical facility. Though I have said that endovascular is important, it doesn't mean that we can do anything with it. We couldn't have definitely opened the Swiss canal with stent. <clears throat> hybridization doesn't mean that we are hybridizing the OT, we are hybridizing ourselves. It is time we, that we embrace as neurosurgeons that endovascular is part of us. It's time to embrace endovascular and, 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 and enforce it into neurosurgical trainings. It has been started in many countries in West and it has also started in India. During my visit to KM Hospital for a short training in endovascular with Dr. Nitin Dange, Professor Nitin Dange, I saw that they had been involved in endovascular at least to learn the basics of DSA, digital subtraction angiography. If you want to remain the superman of neurosurgery or neurovascular, I hope that you need to be a do a teamwork. It doesn't come with only open. It doesn't come with only open. So in my team, we have a superman, we have a Robin, and we have a Batman. Going back to what we started and how long we have gone forward, in 2017, with the help of a a uh, radiologist, interventional radiologist with 17 years of experience in neuroendovascular, we started our services. In 2017, we were able to do just few cases. With the help from a proctor from, in, from Delhi, we started. And then I had the pleasure of training with Dr. Nitin Dange, sir. And then later, we started developing our department. In 2021, we performed the first mechanical thrombectomy with myself and the neuroradiologist at our center. It, it gives immense pleasure to see the recanalization of the blood vessels the moment you do this. This is our current team in 2022. We have a lot of support from regional countries like Nepal, Dr. Robin Butterai. Dr. Arvind in the center and Dr. Kiran Nirola, who is also being hybridized at present at our center. We have a lot of support from cardiology as well. You can see um, fourth from the, from the left, that is Dr. Murari, who is a cardiologist also from Nepal. Of course, we had a lot of hurdles when we started in institutional hurdles, including the grand scale of um, financial burden on the on the on on the hospital, we had to have deals with the companies supplying. So having a large amount of implants parked is immense amount of money. So we we started to develop a trend where we can we could be they lended us instruments and then later on we paid. Luckily in our country, almost all procedures are covered by national insurance. Human resource development, though we started with the proctorship initially, slowly, gradually, we are developing into learning them ourselves. Slowly, gradually, we have started performing mechanical thrombectomies ourselves. All DSS are done by locals, local specialists. And we have even started doing flow diverters and stents slowly. Um, so I thought I would present a bit on what we have done so far. From 2017 to 2022, September, uh, probably a few more cases added after I sent, the, sent my abstract. A total, total of 100 cases we have done so far from 2017 to date, with a, with a small change during the COVID, of course, because of travel restrictions. The most challenging thing for our country is geography. 
our patients stay in far, far, far away islands where the travel is just so much restricted. If weather is bad, it may take two days or three days sometimes. If we are lucky, then we can charter a flight and bring them over. So most of our restrictions in terms of time for treatment is travel. And also during the uh, COVID travel restrictions, we had a lot of issues. Catlip implants, and the least that we thought was the most important of it was specialists, which was not the reason for delay in treatment. So the profile of patients that we have operated according to diagnosis, acute mechanical thrombectomy, uh, we have formed meningioma, large meningioma embolizations before surgery. Most of our work is mainly stroke workup because once the neurologists work, uh, their workup is done, then they send them for further workup. Carotid stenosis is also part of the uh, treatment that we are, as cardiologists and cardiothoracic surgeons have been referring us patients. I know that these are still very preliminary results and we might not be able to uh, say exactly whether these are real numbers yet because it's just, just a very small number and we are yet to see long-term outcome of these patients who have uh, intracranial devices planted. But what we know is we have had very bad experience in one of the cases where we had uh, failure of uh, fluid in, in the bags and we had an air embolism and we had three uh, ischemic strokes after implantation of flow devices and implant migration in one patient, which who the patient who had two aneurysms, we went in and clipped the other one and then removed the implant and secured that as well. Uh, our main mortality was with aneurysm rupture, intraoperative rupture was found in one patient and we had in postoperative bleed in one patient, probably com not completely secured. And we had a very poor uh, patient with an acute limb ischemia, later developed sepsis and passed away. So looking at complications, I wanted to mention that um, it's not only the cranial complications that actually kills these patients, it could be the local pathology as well. So neuroendovascular procedures have a relatively uh, a, um, stable mortality and morbidity rate can be used in an, a large array of neurocerebrovascular and spinal vascular malformations or, or pathologies. In my belief, it is a must in every center which has stroke management. It is a real financial burden. As time is brain, every cell needs to be saved. I think the expenses would ultimately nullify the cost borne by the patient. In neuroendovascular services is an essential part of any department dealing with vascular diseases. So my take home message is I would leave neuroendovascular and open microvascular surgical choices to the neurosurgeon. But I would urge everyone to wear the shoes of endovascular and learn. I think it is time that we hybridize our programs so that we as neurosurgeons are the best among everyone to know the morphology, the pathologies, and really realize whether a particular type of surgery or endovascular procedure is needed. We must be the ones to decide. As long as we decide, I think most of it would be leveled in. So, and I would like to invite everyone for our upcoming conference, but it's a very short notice. Hence, um, my urge to all my professors and all my colleagues in Nepal is try for the next conference. It's a lovely a venue, uh, very good quality papers. And though, as we have started it in 2017, we had a small break and now we are going uh, to have a four day conference where we have live surgeries, um, extensive good workshops like endoscopic cervical spine, as well as um, stealth navigation guidance, and so on. Thank you very much for having me.
Thank you, Dr. Ali. That was a very good presentation on subspecialty practices, which you are doing at your center as a hybridized format. Uh, due to lack of time, I'm sorry that we cannot take any further questions. Thank you once again and wish you the best of luck for your future endeavors. Thank you. Very uh, much. Let me invite uh, Professor Anwar here. He is with us, our uh, co chair, and he's going to present on the, the perspective from Pakistan. So. Thank you for uh, giving me the opportunity. It was a very wonderful experience attending the conference here. And I thanks to all the parts uh, organizers for providing this opportunity. So I will just focus uh, how the Nepalese uh, Nepal PGRs or neurosurgeon can benefit from Pakistan Society of Neurosurgeon or in Pakistan. Next. Uh, okay, I will do it. Yeah. Uh, this is our uh, neurosurgical center, Punjab Institute of Neurosciences at Lahore General Hospital. Lahore. It is a 10 story building having uh, 500 beds. There are three neurosurgical units having more than 130 beds, and then about 100 beds for the neurotrauma. We have eight elective OTs uh, working um, from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. And we have uh, four uh, emergency OTs. They are working around the clock. We perform about uh, 12 uh, surgeries elective per day. And we perform uh, about 20 emergency surgeries around the clock. Uh, we are all the specialties. Uh, we have uh, our own neuro department. We have our own pathology department, neurology department, and uh, we have seven professorial units established at the Punjab Institute of Neurosciences in Lahore, Janastal, Lahore. In addition to this, Punjab Institute of Neurosciences, which are part of this Lahore General Hospital, Lahore, which is 1250 bedded uh, hospital. Con which uh, comprise all the other specialties other than neurosurgery. So this is just one build uh, as a whole, one building complex in which uh, one is the Punjab Institute of Neurosciences, the other is the Lahore General Hospital, Lahore. So a total of about uh, 1,800 beds uh, in total, both including the neurosurgery as well as the General Hospital, Lahore. It is associated with the Mirudin Medical College and Postgraduate Medical Institute, Lahore General Hospital, Lahore. Uh, this is our journal. I am the chief editor. Uh, I am founding chief editor of this journal. It's working since 1998. And uh, we invite all the Nepalese neurosurgeons to publish their articles. We will also include the senior professors from Nepal on the International Editorial Board. And we will also invite young neurosurgeons of Nepal for peer reviewer of this journal. And uh, your publication will be free of cost. And there will be no charges on this journal. Uh, this is just, uh, I'm the chief editor and Dr. Saman Shahid, PhD. She is the associate chief editor of this. And uh, this is the contact address. If you want to publish your articles here, you can send your article here. We will not charge anything uh, from the, from the uh, publishers. Uh, this I was also president of the Soft Neurosurgery Conference, which was organized in 2018 at Lahore. And uh, with me are the eminent neurosurgeon of Pakistan and adjacent countries, and uh, Amjad Shah from UK and uh, from Saudi Arabia and all, all countries. There are a few pictures of the same conference. Uh, with me is the on the left side is Dr. Salman Yunus from Afghanistan and other neurosurgeon from Pakistan. These are all the participants. This is all about the SAR conference which I conducted. Uh, another opportunity to avail is here is the fellowship uh, which we are offering in two fields. In one is vascular, other is spine surgery. These are the three month fellowship. There are no charges. Uh, we give uh, free accommodation. You have only to bear your only food expenses. 
and uh, you uh, being part of the vascular fellowship or spine fellowship you can also observe all the other surgeries being done in diet operation theaters and including brain tumor surgeries and etc uh, this is the same for uh, vascular and these are the my department where we have the uh, party for our vascular fellowships uh, in addition, uh, it's also for your information that those PGR who were wanted to uh, attend the uh, do the uh, post graduation from Pakistan, they will be paid one lakh rupees per month, and uh, they will be provided free accommodation. So far, about uh, twenty neurosurgeons has uh, done their post graduation from Pakistan, and five and more are in the pipelines. And there are two sort of uh, systems. One is the uh, FCPS, one is the MS neurosurgery, both are being done. And I will request the neurosurgeons of Nepal that they should uh, contact to the government of Pakistan or government level that as there are some seats reserved for the MBBS from Nepal, similarly should be reserved seat for specialization from Nepal as well, so that the Nepalese students can get benefit of that. And we will also try to pursue it from Pakistan end but you have to pursue from your Nepal end. In this way, we can uh, progress toward, uh, further. And I will also uh, show my interest that uh, as uh, it has been decided that next SAR, SAR conference will be in the Nepal in September uh, next year. So I, and, uh, and then VP Singh has offered that we will conduct at India in 25. And I offer that we will host uh, in 20, 2022, 27 in Pakistan. Sark News Surgery Conference in 227 in Pakistan. I welcome all you there in Pakistan as well. Thank you very much. Thank you, all the speakers. Well, um, we had actually got a lot of information as to what is being done in neighboring countries. And Nesson has also endorsed a few guidelines and uh, its own commitment to disseminate the services. Can I have that slide on, please? So that's called Pokhara Declaration of Dissemination of Neurosurgical Services. So it says, um, as directed by the Constitution of Nepal, Nesson endorses the concept of health for all. And Dr. Pawan did mention about that. If we can make services available within four hours each, we can help a lot of population uh, at their home itself. So Nesson pledges to access to neurosurgical services to all ne Nepalese, regardless of the place of living. So that's why we wanted to take the services as close to their doorsteps as possible, if in case it's not feasible. Nesson would help neurosurgical programs to train adequate number of trainees to provide for adequate number of neurosurgeons in the country. And still there is a huge gap, almost double what we are required to be an optimum number. Nesson encourages neurosurgical programs to train neurosurgical trainees to serve in underserved areas during their training period. And this has also been included in the, the MEC programs. So a certain amount of uh, community postings has to be inbuilt in their MCS training. And so this will be a good way to expose them to what is going around in the country. It would help services trying to establish themselves in underserved areas by offering voluntary services, paid trips, organizing camps, teleservices, and conducting workshops and meetings on site. So there are many things which are in pipeline where we are trying to do this uh, in the remote areas. And Nesson would help formulate evidence-based guidelines which may be possible to practice within the practical limitations of the resource-constrained services. And that's what we have been hearing for the last few days. Nothing can be copycatted uh, from the Western literature and even at the peripheral cent at tertiary care centers to the periphery. So we need to have certain guidelines which are suited uh, to these uh, places. Nesson would collaborate with government of Nepal and its agency to help achieve the above mentioned uh, objectives. And I'm very much uh, happy to announce that uh, Nesson a spine chapter is now collaborating with the health Ministry of Health and Population to create a, a, a national spine health program, uh, which is basically focusing on these issues. So maybe we will be coming up uh, in a very uh, short time on these uh, things also. Uh, Nesson would serve as a liaison between the government agencies and donors, both national and international, to help achieve the above mentioned objectives. So this is what uh, we are being uh, planning, and uh, we think that these are all feasible things. And Nesson would encourage and acknowledge the members, health workers, and partners who shall achieve this goal. So this is what 
this whole meeting is all about and we are actually recognizing the work being done at the periphery. So with this, uh, I'd like to announce the closure of this session. We are already behind time and uh, we'll invite the MC to announce for the next. Thank you. Thank you, respected delegates, for that very productive symposium. Yeah. It's an honor to have you here with us today. Ladies and gentlemen, sadly, we are running a bit behind our schedule. Hence, I'm afraid we have to cut start our tea break. However, I do request everyone to grab your cup of tea and refreshments and join us back to our next session. Distinguished delegates, participants, we now move on to an important block, the presidential oration. May I request Dr. Yam Bahadur Roka and Dr. Sudan Thakal to kindly take the seats on the dais and begin the session. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, we are going. We are going to start the presidential oration, and uh, as understood, the province trustee is going to deliver uh, the presidential oration. Uh, Dr. Province Presta, though he doesn't need any introduction, he is a senior neurosurgeon, uh, basically based in Kathmandu. Slides, in. and he is engaged in uh, mainly in private practice, and he heads the department in BNB and Norwich Hospital. Uh, he became a member of Nepali Society of Neurosurgeons uh, in 2008 and be became life member in 12. Uh, he was actively involved in nation activities from the very beginning and was elected a member of executive committee in 2010 till 12. Uh, later, he became joint secretary, uh, following uh, and then the general secretary of nation. Currently, he is president, obviously, and he was also an executive editor of. Nepal Journal of Neurosciences from 2008 till 2015, and served as an editor chief from 15 to 17. So he was involved in various subcommittees of EANS and WFNS. So with this short introduction, may I invite uh, Dr. Pravin to continue with his lecture. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Sudan, for the introduction, and uh, thank you very much, uh, the chairpersons and and the whole organizing team uh, for giving me this opportunity today. I really feel privileged to be here today to deliver this uh, talk. Uh, well, uh, we are running out of time. I think I should uh, rush. Uh, so let me start. Well, I'm talking about this high cervical spine swanoma. High cervical spine swanoma includes those uh, which are uh, located in the cranial cervical junction, foramen magnum, magnum, and these at the level of uh, high cervical spine that was C1 and C2. Uh, many authors also include C3, but I haven't really wanted C1 and C2. Uh, these are the high cervical swanoma, the relatively rare uh, entity in our daily neurosurgical practice. And uh, most of the reports uh, that are available about uh, high cervical swanoma are included as a series of uh, spinal swanoma. So uh, the particular uh, literature about this uh, particular topic, high cervical swanoma, are quite scarce. Well, according to the available literature, uh, these high cervical swanoma occupies about 0.1% of all uh, all the swanoma of the human body, about 5.3% of all spinal swanomas, 18% of spinal swanomas, 24% of foramen magnum tumors, and about 34% of foramen magnums, including the osseous tumors. So this is just an illustration of uh, high cervical swanoma. As you can see, uh, uh, swanoma starting from C1 uh, level, and with a huge uh, extension to the extra spinal, extra foramen space. Well, before further going to the uh, uh, higher cervical swanoma, let's talk briefly about swanomas in general. Uh, swanomas are so called neuromas or neurolemas or simply uh, neuronomas. And uh, they are the benign tumors of the swanoma, as you all know, and they are found in all peripheral nerves, including uh, cranial nerves and spinal nerves. Most of them are solitary, they are uh, non-syndromic. Uh, some of them can be associated with NF2, and in that case, they can be multiple. Sometimes uh, meningioma and swanoma are compared with each other, especially if, mm, regarding the incidence. In brain, meningioma is quite more, much more common than swanoma. Uh, swanoma is almost two times more common. In spine, swanoma are more common than uh, meningioma, uh, almost two to four times more common. Uh, Swanomas in spine, whereas again in high cervical region, meningiomas are more common, almost three times more common than uh, swanomas. And also sometimes swanomas and uh, neurofibromas are used synonymously. However, pathologically, as you can see, there is a difference. In case of neurofibroma, the parent nerve is involved and it also 
invest the surrounding structures, whereas in case of Swanama, it grows from a cell and then leaving the parent turf intact. Um, and that is uh, how the Swanama looks like in this uh, picture on the left side, and the neurofibron looks like on the picture in the, in the right side. Well, now talking about uh, spinal mm, spinal tumors uh, comprise about five to ten percent of the all um, uh, CNS tumors. Uh, it occupies almost one third of the primary spinal uh, neoplasia, and among all intradural extramedullary spinal tumors, swanomas occupy about fifty percent of the cases. Meningiomas about twenty percent, and remaining are others. Well, spinal in spinal swanoma, lumbar and thoracic region are the most common location, whereas cervical spine is a rare location for swanoma. And this high cervical is even much rarer. Uh, in relation to dura, in uh, these spinal sonomas are intradural in about 50 to 70 percent of cases, intradural with extradural extension about 15 cases, only extradural about 15 percent, and sometimes rarely it can be intramedullary, occupying about one percent of total spinal sonomas. There's various uh, in, uh, this anatomical classification. This is a simple illustration uh, intradural and uh, intradural with uh, extradural extension, but still uh, intraspinal. This is the extradural, still is intraspinal. This is extradural with extraspinal extension, and then intradural, extradural, and extraspinal um, extension. So in, in this series, uh, only intradural was about half of the cases, around 54%, and only extradural was almost uh, one third of the cases. Now, coming back to high cervical sonoma, usually they are located posterior laterally or sometimes anterolateral or even laterally. Rarely they can be in the ventral midline position. This is just a, an illustration of the ventral midline sonoma. This is not my case. I borrowed it from the literature. And this is one of the big series of spinal sonoma where they found a high cervical sonoma only in about 5% of cases. So they concluded high cervical region is the rarest location for the sonoma. Similarly, this is another series in which they found 8% uh, of the um, cases in high cervical region. And most of the cases were in thoracolumbar spine, 80%. And they found that percentage of extradural and dumbbell sonoma decrease from higher to lower spinal. As you as we go from high to lower level of spine, the number of dumbbell sonoma, the extradural sonoma get less and less. And in this series, the ventral root origin, motor root origin was found to be about 3.5%. And again, in relation to dura, intradural tumors are least common in high cervical region. Extradural tumors are most common in high cervical region. Extraspinal tumors are also most common in high cervical region. And dumbbell tumors are also most common in high cervical region. And among high cervical sonomas, almost 40 to 45 percent of cases are dumbbell tumors. So again, in another series, intradural mm, 16, extradural 38, and dumbbell almost half the cases are 45 percent. So whatever the uh, proportion of the cases may be, almost all the uh, literature show that intradural tumors are less common in high cervical, whereas dumbbell tumors are more common in this uh, high cervical region. Regarding um, dumbbell tumors, uh, this is um, a big series of 647 uh, spinal tumors in which they found 17.5% of cases were the dumbbell tumors. And most of the dumbbell tumors were located in the cervical spine. And most of the tumors were uh, swanoma, occupying almost three, uh, two thirds of the total cases. And they found that even meningiomas and hemangiomas can also present as a dumbbell tumors. And many studies also compared between uh, C2 and C1, which one is more common. And most of them found that C2 is more common than C1 in case of high cervical tumors, swanomas. Multiplicity, tumor recurrence, and radiation in the swanomas, all these are found to be much more common in high cervical spine. But there's no strong evidence suggesting that uh, strong association between these factors and high cervical swanoma. Again, another study of uh, high cervical sonoma. This also found that multiplicity is more common in high cervical spine. Uh, totally intradural is less common, only 70%. And again, possibility of neurofibromatosis association with neuro NF2 is also more common in case of high cervical sonoma. Uh, regarding uh, which root, ventral or dorsal root involvement, uh, in 90 to 95% of cases, it is dorsal root origin, and in about only 3 to 5%, it is ventral root. Uh, and ventral root origin is again much more common in high cervical location. It can go up to uh, as high as 23% of cases in cervical spine. They may ori get origin from the ventral root. And this one of these studies also reviewed 20 cases of the ventral root sonoma, in which they found 10 out of 20 were, were in um, cervical spine, and 8 out of 10 that were in cervical spine were in the high cervical spine, and, uh, one C1 to C3. So this also suggests that 
um, ventral root origin in high cervical sarma is much more common than other levels of the spine. Well, uh, even sex distribution is again same as other swanomas in the spine, but uh, again, young people are found to be found to have more common uh, this high cervical swanoma, but again, there is no strong evidence suggesting uh, young age group and high cervical swanoma. Regarding clinical presentation, it depends on location of the tumor, size of the tumor, and dysfunction of the nerve that has been involved. Mm -hmm. Local neck pain and local symptom, uh, sensory symptoms, paresthesia and numbness in the neck, these are the uh, most common clinical pictures. Radicular pain is less common, motor weakness and malopathy, they are more common, especially in the late stage and especially the tumor is very big. Uh, so local pain, local paresthesia and motor deficits are the most common uh, presentation. Uh, but the um, thing is, these uh, high cervical swanoma, they may present quite late. They may present, present as late as 84 months after the onset of the symptoms. So the uh, duration of first symptom and the uh, diagnosis ranges from one to 84 months is quite long. And many studies also show that average uh, time of presentation is 26 to 32 months. So the reason behind this late presentation is high canal, high space in the um, cervical um, canal in this high cervical region and uh, symptoms progress slowly. And only if it becomes larger, then the patient comes for the treatment. Whatever the initial symptoms may be, at the time of diagnosis, the most common symptoms uh, are motor deficit, sensory deficits, and posterior headache. Sometimes there can be unusual symptoms of high cervical swanoma. Patient may present with generalized headache, continuous headache, repeated syncopal attacks, repeated subarctic hemorrhage. Sometimes, uh, usually, most of the time in our clinical practice, when the patient comes with this type of symptoms, we usually screen brain, but we usually don't tend to go for the spine. But whenever the patient comes with these symptoms, if the uh, treatment doesn't get him better, then probably we may need to screen the spine as well. So sometimes we need to take head and neck as a single organ and uh, screen thoroughly if the patient comes with these symptoms repeatedly. Well, intraoperatively, sometimes it is very difficult to find out which root has been involved dorsal or ventral. A simple rule of thumb is that uh, after the tumor is exposed and after we expose the intact cranial nerves, if the tumor lies dorsal to the intact cranial nerve, cranial, uh, sorry, spinal nerve roots, then it is dorsal. If the tumor lies ventral to the, to the intact uh, nerve roots, then the tumor is ventral. But even then, sometimes it may be difficult to exactly find out. Uh, of course, the, there are resistance challenges because of the location. The, sometimes there can be pile invasion as high as the level of medulla. Sometimes there can be gross adhesion um, with the spinal cord because of the uh, micro hemorrhages, because of the inflammation. Of course, location intradural, extradural, and extra spinal dislocation makes the some, uh, surgery sometimes more difficult. Ventral location is again another challenge uh, during the surgery. And um, if the tumor becomes big, then the surrounding neurovascular uh, structures also lead to the uh, difficulties in the surgical resection. So, uh, according to different uh, literatures that are available, uh, the outcome of the uh, high cervical swanoma can be uh, most of the cases, more than 80% of the cases, they improve after surgical removal. Sometimes, or sometimes uh, in few literatures, many cases also need stage surgery. Uh, if it is big enough, then it can be removed totally or safely in one sitting. Residual tumors have been found in 6 to 10 percent of the cases. Sometimes the case may rather worsen. It has been found of, uh, about less than 5 percent of the cases. Of course, CSF leak can be there. It was found to be in 10 to 13 percent of the cases. No letters have shown immediate uh, post of death. So there is no recorded immediate uh, post of death in such uh, cases in any literature. So now coming to our uh, experience, uh, when we analyzed around 2,500 cases of spinal surgeries, there is uh, spinal tumors occupying about 10% of total spinal tumor surgeries. And out of these uh, different uh, spinal tumors, swanoma, including both intra and extradural, occupied about 30% of the cases, and they were the most common ones. So out of these 69 cases of swanoma, almost half the cases were in lumbar spine. And the number of the uh, cases in cervical and the thoracic spine are almost the same, 18 and 19. And 19 out of... Uh, uh, 69 uh, uh, spinal sonomas were in cervical spine, that's about 28 percent of cases in cervical spine. 35 percent um, out of total cervical sonomas were in high cervical, that is in seven, and 10 percent were uh, out of total spinal sonomas in, were in high cervical. So these 10 percent and 35 percent are slightly in higher proportion in our experience as compared to the others. 
Well, regarding surgical approach, uh, posterior approach is the one that I adopted in almost all the cases. And uh, many available literature suggests that <clears throat> posterior approach is good enough for the safe and total removal of, this, of such tumors, um, whatever, irrespective of the position of the tumor, until and unless it is strictly in the midline ventral, until and unless it is very big in ventral midline position, most of the tumors can be uh, safely removed from posterior approach. That is what we have been doing. And uh, uh, well, uh, the beauty of these tumors um, is uh, there is well-defined arachnoid uh, plane intradurally and well-defined um, plane extra um, uh, capsule, uh, well-defined capsule extradurally. So as long as we uh, dissect intracapsule scan uh, capsule space, then we can preserve, if we want, we can preserve even the parent nerve and also we can preserve the surrounding neurovascular structures. So uh, intraoperative uh, neurofield monitoring were done only in few cases, in, uh, only it started recently. Uh, in our case, uh, we didn't need to do any fixes and stabilization procedures. Of course, micro instruments are vital and uh, minimally invasive surgery were not done in this kind of uh, cervical swanama. Uh, well, regarding nerve root uh, sacrifice, uh, sacrifice can be done in case of uh, uh, dorsal uh, root involvement. Uh, many studies have shown that it is safe, but uh, um, uh, even, even the literature show that uh, even the ventral root or sometimes even both ventral and dorsal root cannot be sacrificed. Um, however, in case of large tumors, uh, for the sake of total complete, complete resection of the tumor, it is better to uh, sacrifice the nerve root. That is what the literature suggests. And studies have shown that um, the involved spinal roots are frequently non-functional uh, because of the long-standing this uh, tumor, so it can be easily sacrificed. Um, it is also found in the literature that if the nerve root is preserved, then the rate of uh, recurrence is likely to be higher. So in that sense, also probably uh, sacrificing the uh, nerve of origin is a better idea. But few also few reports have also uh, suggested that the severe post-operative motor deficit may develop when a motor nerve is sacrificed. So it is very tricky whether to preserve or not. But most of in most of the cases it can be sacrificed, and of course with the help of intraoperative physiological monitoring, uh, we, it will be much more easier for us to decide whether to leave it or sacrifice. Uh, if resected subtotally, this is um, another uh, big series of spinal sonomas in which they found twelve percent of the cases had. A residual tumor but because of uh, difficulty in total resection and out of those 12 percent residual tumors 30 percent uh, in 30 percent uh, cases regrowth was observed in five years time and uh, in, uh, this uh, as far as the ki um, 67 index is concerned in recurrent cases it was more than 6.3 percent whereas in normal non-recurrent cases it was only it was 3.5 percent I have just a few illustrations uh, because of time limitation. Uh, this is this is the lady uh, with uh, um, uh, neck pain and uh, some radicular symptom in the upper uh, um, upper left shoulder area. Uh, as you can see, you know, the lesion is at the level of C1, also extending to the C2, with uh, significant uh, extra foraminal and extra spinal extension reaching up to the uh, particular artery. And when we opened the dura, there was nothing inside the dura. Dura was very clean, internal space was very nice, but the tumor was totally out of dura. Total excision was done. So this was the total extra dural uh, high cervical sonoma and complete resection was possible. And after the surgery, the patient became much uh, better. Uh, and there's no um, instability of the spine. Similarly, this is another case, small boy with um, huge um, extra spinal component of the tumor originating from C1 and C2 intradural space. As you can see, the C1 bone uh, was also uh, eroded because of the tumor. And uh, this was the poisoning and skin incision plan to remove the complete, uh, to remove the extra spinal component totally. And uh, the um, parent nerve root, was, nerve root was also sacrificed. The boy is uh, completely much, uh, became much better after surgery. Total excision was possible. And uh, it's been already six, seven years that he was operated and uh, the boy uh, comes for follow-up almost every year and there's no sign of recurrence or regia. Similarly, this is another lady with a similar same type of the symptoms uh, with a tumor located at the level of C1, C2 with significant extra foraminal and extra spinal uh, extension reaching up to the PA level. 
again same technique same dissection same approach again total dissection the patient is uh, complete dissection and there is no sign of recurrence uh, so far so in our experience um, all uh, six out of seven cases were intradural with extra dural extension with huge and significant extra spinal component only one case was extra dural there is no, no totally intradural uh, case cases uh, all the um, uh, in all the cases um, uh, dorsal root uh, was uh, the parent nerve uh, in few of those cases i had difficulty in exactly finding out whether it was um, uh, dorsal or uh, uh, ventral root and all the cases were a uh, single case so total resection was done in all the cases no post operative neurological deficits were observed so uh, luckily so far um, there was no there is no recurrence so far and of course it is a very small um, experience as compared to, compared to other bigger experiences so before I conclude, uh, this is the uh, one of the big series of spinal sonoma. It, they have covered um, the cases over 60 years. And what they concluded is, despite significant advancement in diagnostic and surgical tools, surgical te technique remained the same. And I fully agree with this uh, uh, conclusion. Well, uh, in conclusion, uh, wide, uh, there are a wide variety of uh, location in the spine where the sonomas can arise, sonomas can develop. And accordingly, we have to uh, develop our experience, knowledge, skill, and everything so that we can uh, take out the tumor completely because total excision should be the goal in case of a sonoma so that there, is, there won't be any recurrence in future. Especially for the young neurosurgeons, this is very rewarding surgery. If you uh, go for the smaller cases, especially those in the uh, thoracic lumbar region, once you take out the tumor totally, once the patient becomes big, uh, better, then it's very rewarding surgery. Then definitely, even in such cases of high cervical sonoma with significant uh, extra spinal cases, the surgery becomes much easier. And whenever there is a residual tumor, then uh, uh, KI-67 assessment should be done so that uh, we, uh, we can uh, predict the possibility of the recurrence and if there is sign of recurrence then we have to manage this further with maybe second surgery or maybe with uh, radiation therapy or maybe other some other um, therapeutic procedures so uh, lastly uh, despite all technical difficulties uh, the total and safe resection of this high cervical sonoma is possible and surgery for this high cervical sonoma is usually successful so you don't need to worry about these technical difficulties once you have adequate uh, experience and skill then definitely you will be successful in such cases thank you very much thank you thank you thank you dr Praveen, for in thank detail you. in depth description of uh, high cervical sonomas including your surgical case series with such excellent result i think uh, the session is concluded now. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Swester, for bringing us a very informative audition. Ladies and gentlemen, we will now have parallel breakout session here and in the neighboring halls. So I humbly request the delegates and participants to be seated in their respective halls. Our next session here is on techniques, information, and outcome, a very promising topic indeed. May I have the honor of having Dr. Tanda Prakash Limbu and Dr. Nisan Goyal Andai to kindly moderate the session. I would like to call my teacher, Dr. Basana Panta, to present his topic. Uh, slide, please. Today, I'm going to talk about uh, the bypass, uh, utility of bypass in many techniques, especially starting from uh, uh, aneurysm surgery and then going on to more complicated sort of bypass that we have been doing in our institute. I have requested uh, the scientific committee to give me two minutes extra for since uh, it's a long presentation. Um, as you can see, you know, uh, if there is ischemia in the brain, the first thing that uh, goes off is uh, electrical activity of the brain, and then as the ischemia goes down to thirty, 
um, there will be membrane failure, but it is still reversible. But when it is deep down, then you have, you know, permanent uh, brain uh, cell damage, uh, which is irreversible. So this is the this is the area where you have to always play, and then you have to maintain that perfusion into the brain. That's the most important fact. So several blood flow and bypass, we have 750 ml of blood per minute, 15% of uh, cardiac output, and 50 ml of blood for 100 gram of brain per minute. So this is the cut mark. And if we do a single barrel STMCA bypass, it will give you a 39 ml per minute of blood. And if you do a double barrel STMCA bypass, it's about 69 or almost 70. And if you do a high flow bypass of saphenous pain or radial pain artery, then it's about 110 ml per minute. So this fact needs to be considered when you are doing which bypass on which individual case. So you should anticipate, prepare yourself, practice, and then only perform. You know, in the middle of the aneurysm surgery, you cannot just say, okay, today I'm going to do bypass because it's complicated. You have to anticipate. You have to practice in the lab beforehand and in the microscope. And then only, you know, you should practice with 10-0, 11-0, um, which is pretty difficult unless you practice it. These days also when I'm doing, I'm doing a bypass tomorrow, I do one practice uh, one day ahead, you know. So this is still my practice. So uh, about studying the brain perfusion, uh, MR perfusion is one of the best technique that we are really underutilizing. And also you should do a balloon matas test where you put a balloon on the opposite side of the carotid and then perfuse and see the cross circulation and how the patient will tolerate most likely, you know. And um, the best is uh, not only CBF, CBB, MTT and TTP, but you should also do a Diamox challenge to see how much of the brain reserve, circulation reserve there is. So for line giant aneurysm, we, we can do proximal ligation, trapping, low flow bypass, high flow bypass, and rescue bypass. Rescue bypass is when you are doing a M2 bypass and you feel that uh, while doing a M2 bypass, the ischemia time will be too long. Then you first do a STA MCA M4 bypass and then go down and do a M2 bypass. So this is called a rescue bypass. Uh, possible uh, complications that you can have is graft occlusion, uh, which is more likely in um, subclavian vein. Um, uh, the vein, if, if you take the vein, and graft spasm, which is more commonly seen in arterial graft, uh, this uh, uh, radial artery graft, hyperperfusion. Hyperperfusion is another problem that you have to face. So you have to think. After you do a bypass, you have to keep the blood pressure very, very strictly um, monitored. So about 20% of you know, uh, pre-op uh, BP up and down you can maintain. And wake the patient as soon as possible. We don't want to ventilate because we have to see what's going on. You know? And uh, use adequate heparin during anastomosis and uh, double platelet is in post-op. So this is a case where there is a very large cavernous segment uh, IC ophthalmic aneurysm with the complete blindness on one eye. And uh, there is hardly any chance that we can recover this eye. If it is pituitary, it comes back, but if it is a vascular, then they don't come back, you know. It will never come back. So uh, one of the options that we had was proximal uh, ligation just proximal, simple proximal ligation. So here we did um, intraoperative EEG monitoring, and then we opened up uh, the carotid and we studied the stump pressure, which should be at least 35 millimeter of ERG. In this case, it was more than 45. And then simply we ligated uh, the proximal artery and then C was okay. So this very simple technique can be done under local anesthesia if you don't have all this experience. You just wake up the patient and lie it, you know, clamp the carotid, ask them to squeeze in awake, and then, you know, bring them into hypotension and then do that for another 20 minutes. If there is no deficit, then you just lie it and the surgery is finished. Very simple. 
Uh, another case where you can see again a very large uh, cavernous uh, aneurysm. Here, the lady did not tolerate it cross flow. Um, the balloon matter slide, uh, test was done here. As you can see, the opposite side is inflated with balloon, and there's a cross flow. And there is, you know, the aneurysm is not being seen, but uh, she was not tolerating because the backflow was not very good. So, here again, uh, we had to, you know, um, uh, no, sorry. In this case, we can you go back? Back, back, back. So, again, in this case, actually, I'm sorry, this patient also tolerated. So we just did a proximal ligation in this case. And you can see immediately there's a thrombus occurring in, in the aneurysm itself. Um, sometime in a fusiform aneurysm like this on a vertebral artery, which cannot be clipped, and then the pica is arising from there. So, you know, we presume that if we do a proximal clipping, uh, we want to see how the pica will perfuse. And uh, we did an ICG once we, you know, temporarily clipped this artery and then there was, pica was nicely perfusing, but the aneurysm was not seen. So in this case also, we just simply, you know, uh, clipped the proximal artery and you can see that the pica is perfusing, the aneurysm is gone. So simple thing can be helpful in a complicated aneurysm like this. Uh, this is another case where uh, we did a proximal uh, ligation of the carotid, but the aneurysm is still, you know, it's not thrombosed. So in such cases, you might have to go in and do a bypass in a second stage, and then, you know, also uh, occlude the distal artery so that it's a trapping rather than proximal ligation. So like in this case where you can see a giant MCA aneurysm, and uh, two of the arteries are coming and um, it's almost impossible to clip this aneurysm and uh, partially thrombosed as well. So this aneurysm is actually much, much bigger than what you see here. So here we did a very simple, you know, uh, SAMC anastomosis. And uh, once we are confirmed that the anastomosis is functioning, then we just uh, ligated the proximal uh, M1 segment. That is after the um, thalamostride uh, vessels are uh, taken off. Can you run the video? So for STMC anastomosis, you try to identify uh, the bigger one, uh, preferably more than 10 millimeter, and then take out the superficial temporal artery. The time constraint, I you know made it faster. We use ten zero, uh, but we practice with eleven zero. And uh, sometimes, if it's very very difficult, we may have to deeper. Is sometimes we use nine zero. And uh, so this is the lady after surgery. She had got a little bit of weakness. Otherwise, you know, there's a nice perfusion from the other side, and the aneurysm is totally gone. Another case of uh, IC ophthalmic, this lady didn't tolerate uh, balloon matas test. So we, we prepared for the bypass. So in this case, we wanted to go for M2. So we did a long saphenous uh, bypass uh, from uh, external carotid, uh, the, sorry, the internal carotid to M2. And we leave the external carotid. We do not touch the external carotid. So it's a, you know, side to, uh, side anastomosis. And then um, both of the arteries were, so it is a, a trapping, not only proximal ligation, but trapping. Uh, video. So usual sylvian, and M2 is pretty difficult because it's deep, you know. M4 is very easy, but M2 is difficult. So the aneurysm, is not seen in this case. So you are just working with normal you know, artery. And then we, we always have a Dacron uh, tube in which we pass the uh, saphenous vein, otherwise it will be, it will collapse. And then the pro proximal part is also, and the distal part, both is trapped. 
and the aneurysm is isolated and the well perfused bypass is there. Another case, uh, again, I see ophthalmic with visual loss, very, very big tumor uh, aneurysm. And here again, we did a, you know, a bypass from EC to IC, and uh, that is uh, the anastomosis. This is again in M2. So you can see that uh, the bypass is well perfused in the M2 here, and the aneurysm is gone. And here also we did a trapping. So, you know, uh, internal carotid as well as the distal part is occluded. So that is uh, post-op. You can see well thrombosed aneurysm. Another case where uh, a long similar thing is done, where there's a big bypass with a saponous pain is done there in onium too. This lady had a two, uh, M, this is on M1, M2 junction aneurysm where you can see there's a two arteries that is coming from the aneurysm itself. So we, we thought we will do a double bypass. So what we did was we take out the saphenous vein and then we cut it and then first did a saphenous to saphenous Y. We made a saphenous to saphenous Y and then double bypass like this over here. And uh, so that is the last, what you see. Uh, can I have the video? Short one. But you can also do this by uh, taking out two, both of the MCA, uh, uh, STA, both of the STA, or you can do it with cutting the saphenous in two half and saphenous to saphenous and saphenous to M4. So that's the post-op. A little bit of infarction is there. Otherwise, the patient looks good. That's the boy, be pretty young boy. And uh, he's weak. There's no weakness. Uh, so sometimes we see, you know, this is shown by Jessica. This is the last case we did maybe two week, two weeks back. Again, we did a bypass and then did a trapping on this case. I don't have a post-op image yet, but most of the part of the aneurysm is thrombosed in this case. Uh, another case. So by doing these cases, then we started doing more of a uh, bypass surgery in other cases, like, you know, some examples like Takayasu's disease. The lady had a multiple infarctions, young lady. So you can see that there is a carotid stenosis there, a very severe, and also a M1 stenosis. So we did a STMC bypass on this lady. And she looks pretty good, but then probably we need to follow up her and then do more bypass in the future. And um, in cases of uh, IC occlusion, if the, it is a IC stenosis, carotid endarterectomy or stenting is the best option, but when you have a carotid occlusion, then you cannot open it up. So these are the case, very good case for bypass. And here, the, since it's a high flow occlusion, we tend to do a double STAMC a bypass. So we take out frontal and parietal branch and then bypass both of them at the same go. So uh, my technique is I don't cut the uh, STA till the end of the craniotomy. I keep it flowing. And then once uh, everything is open and once I identify which artery I'm going to bypass, then only I cut the STA at the end. Uh, another case of uh, like a MCA uh, almost occlusion with some perfusion and there's a watershed infarctions. So there's a salvageable brain. If it is a complete uh, infarction, there's no point in doing surgery. But when you see a watershed infarction like this and it's a salvageable, then these are very, very good candidate for STMC anastomosis. Only 28 years girl. And she had protein C, protein S deficiency. Now we have started Moya Moya bypass, which is a little bit difficult, a little bit tricky as well, because they present in child. Uh, we have only three cases till now. And this is one case where you can see that there's a complete occlusion of uh, the IC top and the posterior circulation is pretty good. Moya Moya is a Japanese word where you see small vessels arising from after the occlusion, a uh, neovascular genesis. We see that the STA is pretty good frontal parietal, both branches were very good. So we put the patient and uh, we uh, do a T incision in a case like this. 
and then you know try to make a very very big flag as big as possible so that we can invert the dura as you know the out can you go back the outside of the dura is vascular and the inside of the dura is just plain so we invert the dura and put the vascular side on all over on top of the brain so that there's a indirect anastomosis together with a direct you know SCAMC bypass and if it is if the size is somewhere around 0.8 it's possible uh, for me maybe you know people can do 0.6 also but if it is not pointed then i just stop there and say okay i'm not going to do a direct anastomosis and just continue with indirect anastomosis because after 0 0.8 0 0.7 it's, it's going to be very very difficult so this boy we did uh, both sides this was first time we did uh, on left side which was the more symptomatic side and recently we did uh, on the right side also we also do uh, direct and indirect anastomosis both in these cases so emas as well as stmc anastomosis so um, you know until bypass surgery it, if if you utilize bypass surgery it will help you in many surgeries and you it raises your confidence level when you are having trouble you can just start doing bypass and then you will save the patient and um, cardiac surgeons are utilizing bypass right and left and you know many of them are just eating by doing you know coronary bypass but we have so many things to do so we are not utilizing bypass surgery almost zero so i think it's a high time that you know new generation take up this and you know, new generation, younger people will be better with suturing in a very, very fine location. So I recommend that we do more and more uh, cerebral ischemia cases. And when we start doing in a big scale, it will open up new avenue in neurosurgery. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Basant Pan. Uh, Basant Pan. Uh, we fully agree with you that we should over, we should utilize it more, and we are literally underutilizing it. The technique of bypass. We won't have any questions because we don't have any time. We can have the questions over the lunch probably. Thank you very much. I would like now like to invite Dr. Sam Sambardhan the body for his talk on engineering and innovations in neurosurgery, technological advance advancement in Nepal. Good afternoon, everyone. I am Samarvan Darbhatta, a medical engineer from Annapurna Neurological Institute and Allied Sciences. Today, I am presenting on the topic Engineering and Innovation in Neurosurgery, Technological Advancement in Nepal. I am going to briefly discuss about different technologies used in our center. So, talking about the medical device, uh, according to WHO, any tools, devices, or technologies that are used in patient diagnosis, treatment, and care are termed as medical devices. And since the invention of eyeglasses and stethoscope, the medical technology has advanced a lot. And such advancement in medical technology is always directed towards the better diagnosis and proper care for the patient. And with the use of such medical technologies, medical science has been able to prolong human life as well as to provide the quality of life to a diseased and disabled personnel. <laughs> the modern technologies that has been introduced in medical sciences include artificial intelligence, telemedicine, brain computer interface and nanomedicine. So neurosurgery being one of the most complicated and delicate field of surgery, it requires a lot of tools and technologies for the better outcome and better result for the patient, uh, of patient treatment. And for this neurosurgery has been able to practice lots of technologically advanced tools and technologies in past few decades. And luckily we are also uh, able to introduce some of them in Nepal as well. The first thing for the neurosurgery is diagnosis and diagnosis in neurosurgical cases is possible only with good medical imaging technology. So we have been using CT scans and CT angiography regularly and this uh, technology is almost available in every center of Nepal. The another thing is MRI images. Uh, we have already introduced three Tesla uh, MRI, which is one of the most uh, advanced technology in medical field. And along with uh, three Tesla medical MRI imaging, we have also introduced like functional MRI, DTI, MRS, and uh, tactographic imaging in our center as well. So other thing we have been regularly doing in our center is deep brain stimulation. Uh, deep brain stimulation is usually done for the patient uh, to treat the patient of uh, movement disorder. There are two 
uh, options for the patient either to go for the battery placement uh, with the permanently placed leads in the brain or for the ablation of the specific part of the brain to suppress the hyperactive areas of the brain that we call lesioning. We have been doing BVS since past seven years, since 2015 and till date, we have done 108 cases of DVS, which includes both battery placement and lesioning, out of which 24 cases were for uh, placement of the batteries and 76% of the cases were for the lesioning. These are the batteries we have been using, the Sinre battery designed from Sinre Medical of China. And previously we used to do the DVS with St. Jude batteries. Talking about lesioning, we have been we have done 84 cases of lesioning, out of which 40 cases were for Parkinson's, nine for essential tremor, nine for plastic specific dystonia, 23 for uh, generalized dystonia, and three for Huntington Korea. And additionally, we have done two cases of replacement of the batteries for the patient who had uh, depletion of the batteries who in, implanted the batteries seven years back. So uh, this is what we have invented. Uh, ourselves uh, we need to do one case of obsessive compulsion disorder and we required a lesioning probe of uh, larger size which uh, previously we used to do with 2 mm exposed tip and 0.75 millimeter diameter but for the case of ocd we required the probe with uh, exposure tip with uh, 5 millimeter so we used an evd stylet and uh, designed it ourselves uh, for the process of lesioning, uh, and we use that with in conjunction with the monopolar to make a lesion at the specific area of the brain. So another one is another one technology is neuro navigation. There are two kinds: frame based and frameless system. In frame based system, we have been using ZD frames and coma frames for the targeting of the tumors. Uh, this is how we do planning and how we cross check the uh accuracy of the target that we have um, set another one is frameless system we have been using hrs navigation system in our institute and in this uh we just uh, take a dicom images from imaging system and then register it with the uh, software for navigation till now we have done more than 600 cases of neuro navigation in our system out of which most of them were for glymas and then for meningiomas the other technology we have been using regularly in our center is intraoperative neuromonitoring. This, uh, this system checks for the integrity of the neural network during the surgery and different uh, modalities for intraoperative neuromonitoring can be used like uh, motor evoke potential, sensory evoke potential, brain, uh, auditory potential, and PEP. All of them which have been we, we have been using regularly in our center. This uh, intraoperative neuromonitoring can be analogous to a battery connected to a bulb as long as the connection between the battery and bulb is intact the the bulb light so as long as the connection between the brain and the muscle is intact the functional activity of the muscle is uh, in, intact so our experience with uh, intraoperative neuromonitoring this is the catheter electrode that we have designed ourselves using a ecosy electrode in a foliage catheter to uh, monitor the urinary sphincter during the surgery. And this was the graph we obtained. And we additionally, we also used an surface electrode in uh, penis to monitor the BCR reflexes during the surgery. This, with this, we were able to preserve the uh, functioning of the urinary sphincter. Previously, we used foliage catheter in uh, conjunction with a pressure transducer to monitor the uh, urinary sphincter and anal sphincter as well. Another one is uh, extraocular muscle monitoring and BEP monitoring in cavernous sinus tumor. Uh, with this uh, system, we successfully dissected the tumor from the cavernous sinus, sinus preserving the functioning of the optic nerve. Another one is we did MEP monitoring in parietal SOL. Uh, we did MEP along with uh, cortical mapping using a bipolar stimulation so that the tumor was successfully resected, uh, protecting the hand, hand and the limbs area from the brain. We have incorporated EMG in writer's cramp and lesioning as well. So we have done EMG while performing a writer's cramp. And as you can see in the graph, the, the EMG uh, signals uh, in the baseline was improved after the lesions was made in BOA, BOP junction. This is the thing we have been continuously using since past two years, 3D printing and uh, customized cranial defect, uh, <coughs> cranial defect. 
we use CT scan images and uh, 3D reconstruct it to uh, design the specific implant to a patient who requires a cranial implant. This is the 3D printer we have in our center. And uh, these are the implantable PMMA bone cement implants that can be used in cranial cases. And this is the interop images. images. <clears throat> we have done more than 40 cases of uh, customized 3D printing implants in patients in not only in our center, but in different centers of Nepal. And this is the pre-op and post-op image of one of the cases that we did uh, recently. So these are the technologies that we have been using. And in future, we can also introduce like MR-guided focused ultrasound in our center and navigation-guided transcranial magnetic stimulation for cortical mapping, non-invasive application of the brain, tumor, and uh, lesioning of the brain. So engineering has been playing a vital role in serving a healthcare and bringing about technological advancement in healthcare from engineered product like artificial dura to the complicated technology of MRI has already been introduced in Nepal and has been serving in neurosurgery. But with all, though with limited resources, we have been producing locally engineered uh, catheters and different devices in our center to promote uh, neurosurgery and provide better healthcare to the patient. These are three papers. So to conclude, modern technologies have developed uh, different technologies that have been uh, helping the healthcare. And such technology has been always able to upgrade the patient's safety, reduce surgical time with minimally and non-invasive procedures. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. for very informative presentation. So next presenter, I would like to call Ashish Zangthaba to present his topic, the surgical outcome of epidural hematoma in elderly population, our experience. Thank you, Nishan, for inviting me here to present my case. Uh, slide, please. Uh, most of our presenters have presented a very uh, used cases. My case is rather simple, uh, epidural hematoma. It's quite simple for every neurosurgeons. We all know that. Uh, this is uh, my presentation about the outcome of epidural hematoma in elderly population. As we know, uh, epidural hematoma in elderly population is quite rare. So these are the layouts for today. So actually, there are very limited studies focusing on the management and outcome of uh, epidural hematoma in elderly population as it, as it is very rare in occurrence. So the objective of my presentation is uh, to bridge the gap of lack of studies and share our experience in management of epidural hematoma in elderly population and its outcome. So it was a retrospective observational study conducted at Neurocardio Multispeciality Hospital Biratnagar uh, from, the, from February 2010 to June 2022. So the inclusion criteria were is greater than and equal to 60, pure EDS without any other intracranial hematomas, uh, post-traumatic EDS, EDS of volume greater than and equal to 30 ml, and greater than or equal to 20 ml for temporal and posterior fossa. The exclusion criteria were the subjects with other comorbidities like hypertension, diabetes, COPD, polytrauma cases, and iatrogenic EDS were excluded from the study. Uh, surgical procedures, sight-teller craniotomy or craniectomy was done along with hematoma evacuation. Uh, the follow-up, the patient's outcome was evaluated using Glasgow outcome score. The follow-up was maintained with records from hospital out visits non-responsive non patients and dead patients were considered to be lost in the follow-up and were assigned zero for the follow-up time. Statistical analysis was done using IBM SPSS software and categorical variables were expressed in percentage and quantitative variables were expressed in mean plus minus standard deviation. Uh, to, no, this is not the slide. This is not the one. Where are the other one? My label. So anyway, uh, there was something else also. Uh, total of 814 EDS cases were evacuated at our center. 
uh, among, among that only 24 cases were included in this study, which were elderly population uh, that constitutes of that constitutes of only 2.94 percentage and the is the mean age was 66.5 with 60 being the minimum and 83 being the maximum age hospital stay was 11.2 uh, with minimum of five days and the maximum of 21 days the follow-up time in months was 7.67 for mean and that was zero to 15 because some patients were lost in the follow-up and dead patients were assigned zero uh, male female distribution male predominated our study with 70.83 percent uh, mode of trauma uh, fall injury was the most common mode of trauma followed by rta uh, site 66.867 percent were right sided and only one case was bilateral that is 4.17 percent and GCS on admission was categorized from 3 to 7 being severe, 8 to 12 being moderate, and 13 to 15 being mild. And most of the patients were under 13 to 15 GCS category, that is 87.5%. Uh, coming to the site of EDS, uh, parietal EDS being the most common with 29.2%, followed by frontal and temporal. Uh, complications. There was only one complicated case of chest infection and the patient eventually expired. Uh, rather, 95.83% had no complications, even including surgical side infection. So the outcome was quite good. Moderate disability was seen in one patient, death was seen in one patient, and 91.67% had good recovery. Uh, discussion, I don't think there is much to discuss. Uh, I just found two papers quite similar to my study. Uh, mostly in our center, all the cases which we have, complicated cases, we have excluded. Patients with other intracranial hematomas were excluded. And maybe most of the studies, these two studies, they say that they, are, they have yet to encounter the worst cases. Maybe these 12, 13 years of neurosurgery in neurocardio multi-speciality hospital, maybe we also have yet to encounter the worst cases. So the outcome was quite good. And all the cases included in studies had pre-operative good GCS score. So this is a recently operated case, 83 years old male, male patient. He had fall from stairs. Uh, his presenting GCS was 14. People were bilaterally equal and reacting to light. And we can see the EDS and this is the most operative scan. A uh, conclusion from this study, uh, we can conclude the timely intervention and uh, in absence of other intracranial pathologies like subdural or contusion, the EDS itself has a rewarding outcome. Uh, shortcomings of this, uh, this is a non-prospective, non-randomized study with less number of patients and most of the other comorbidities were ex excluded. So uh, the uh, outcome was very more favorable and predictable. Thank you all. Thank you, Dr. Ashish. I would like to now invite uh, Dr. Benit Kumar Jha for the next talk. So, if he's is not here then the session we call the session to an end yes thank you doctors for sharing us your scientific works and presentation respected delegates at last but definitely not the least we are now at the final scientific session of the conference on how do i do it may i please invite respected dr bal gopal karmacharya and dr saf uh, suffers Ansari on the dais to moderate the session.
Uh, now, uh, we have an online presentation by Dr. Aditya Gupta. He will be presenting today, uh, talking about cyber knife for brain tumors. Good afternoon, everyone. I think it's a, it's a pleasure for me to be here. Uh, I'm sorry I couldn't make it physically. Um, so I'll just do a very quick presentation about my topic, which is cyber knife for brain tumors. So are my slides visible? Yes. Hello? Yes. You can see your slides. Is, is my title slide visible? Hello. Yes, we can speak it full screen. Uh, I think that is the problem. It's sometimes it doesn't go into full screen. Let me do that. Can you see it full screen now? Uh, okay. Let me start sharing again. Uh, can you see the first slide? Yes, we can see it. Okay, I think let me do it like this only. So I'd like to give a short talk on cyber knife for brain tumors. Now, as we know, the radio surgery concept is very similar to the surgery concept. Basically, we want to hit hard only where it is needed. And we really want to avoid any collateral damage. Now, radio surgery, as we know, is the precise delivery, usually of a very high dose of radiation to an imaging defined target within the brain or even the spine. Now, most of us uh, do these kind of cases in which you see this large posterior fossa tumor on the left side looks to be that it could be invading the brainstem. But then if you do surgery well, you realize that uh, all of it can actually be removed uh, very easily. Now, radio surgery is no different. And one of the reasons why radio surgery is becoming so popular is that it is non-invasive pain-free and risk-free. And in fact, I would say in many, many cases, the outcomes are on par or even better than surgery, uh, but in selected cases. So in that sense, it should not be looked upon as a replacement for surgery. Now, it's just not a fancy term. There is a lot of radiobiology behind it. And as we know that any time that you deliver more than six to eight grays of radiation in a single session, there are different biological pathways which come into action and we can achieve a very, very high proportion of cell damage and cell death for the tumor cells vis-a-vis -vis the conventional fractionated radiation therapy. Now, radio surgery technology has come a long way from the initial gamma knife, which was devised by Professor Lexell. And basically, what we currently have is a proliferation of many kinds of linear accelerators, uh, which basically uh, enable us to deliver a very high dose of radiation. Uh, but uh, really, uh, they, the technology is slightly um, sort of in a different fashion, it achieves the same result. Now, uh, just a sec, my slides are not proceeding ahead. Yeah, so CyberKnife basically is what I use and to demystify it, CyberKnife is basically an industrial robot which carries a very compact linear accelerator. Now, the whole shift of radio surgery has been from frame-based systems to frameless systems. Uh, 
there are basically two main advantages. One is that for frameless, you avoid the painful part of having a frame. And because you're able to do that, the, the mask, which is the replacement for the frame and which is non-invasive can be applied repeatedly. And therefore you can fractionate your treatment when you're treating close to the critical areas or slightly larger volumes. Now, the in, in a nutshell, the main component of radio surgery system is that it should be able to achieve a very steep fall off of radiation outside the area of interest. And that depends on several physical parameters, which I have listed here. And basically that is what achieves us, uh, helps us to achieve a very high dose. For example, this prolactinoma that we were treating with the gamma knife, 40 grays of radiation is what we are giving to the margin of this tumor. And the green line, which is a 10 gray line is not even touching the optic chiasm, which is located very, very close to this tumor. So this kind of a very high dose fall off is what is very important for radio surgery. Now in gamma knife, what we do is basically we do what is called as a forward planning in which we actually put these spheres of radiation to fill up a tumor. As compared to that in cyber knife, we shoot varying beams of radiation at different angles. It's more or less like painting a tumor with a particular dose of radiation. Now coming to the dose, the basic choice of dose depends on choosing a dose so that you have a very high degree of tumor control. But as you go along these two sigmoid curves of uh, the tumor uh, dose, you realize that at some point of a dose, the normal tissue will also start getting damaged more. So the point is to choose something like a dose which is along that red arrow in which you have a very high degree percentage of tumor control, but you have a very low percentage probability of uh, normal tissue damage. Now, surprisingly, many of the uh, tumors that we treat now with the low dose of radiation, initially were treated with a very high dose of radiation. So craniopharyngiomas, acoustic schwannomas, even arteriovenous malformations were initially treated with a very high dose of radiation, which we now know is not required. Now, the several important studies were done to define what is the safe dose for a particular target. So we now know that if a target is around 20 millimeters in size, the maximum margin dose, which can be safely given is around 24 gray. And correspondingly, you will see as the target size increases, the maximal safe dose also reduces with that. So these are the current recommended margin doses for the different tumors and other indications for radio surgery. Uh, this is an example of a meningioma, which was encompassing almost 200 degrees of the optic canal and also a part of the optic nerve. So we had the possibility of treating this patient uh, in three fractions, not one, to achieve a higher degree of normal tissue sparing. Now to show you the main indications, basically the main indications are, the best indications are limited size benign tumors like meningiomas, pituitary adenomas, and schwannomas, including vestibular schwannomas. And I'll start with showing you the, basically the first indication which started when radio surgery started, is basically to do radio surgery for residual tumors. Now, this is one of my recent cases in which it was a very large fifth nerve schwannoma. So I operated this patient around, I think, eight months ago. And this uh, on the right side is the scan showing a very small residual in the cavernous sinus region on the right side. And this was an excellent indication for doing cyber knife. Now, many patients come to us asking for cyber knife treatment rather than surgery. And the reason is that for many tumors like small and moderate sized acoustics, the radio surgery has completely changed the management because of the high degree of comfort, a very, very good percentage of tumor control probability. And notice the very small risk of facial palsy, which is something like three or 4% compared to at least a 10, 15, 20% risk in surgery. Now, in many cases, we find that <clears throat> radio surgery is actually the best option. So this is a patient with meningiomas on both the sides. Uh, he refused to have two surgeries. 
So as a other option, we tried three session CyberKnife, and you can see that it worked very well. Cavernous sinus lesions, and this one on the left side of the cavernous sinus, are excellent indications for radio surgery. And this is a lady who did not want the 10-15% risk of ophthalmoparesis after a cavernous sinus surgery. So this is, again, an excellent indication for doing CyberKnife. Limited size tumors. You can notice this tumor is away from the visual pathway. So an excellent indication for CyberKnife. Now, sometimes we are stuck what to do. So this 70-year-old gentleman with worsening ataxia, and uh, he was on clopidogrel post-CABG. Clopidogrel could not be stopped, and the ataxia was worsening. So as the only possible available option, we took him up for a five-session cyber knife because the tumor volume was large, and you can see an excellent result at the end of two years. Now, this lady herself, a cardiologist, did not agree, despite repeated counseling, to have surgery for this neurocytoma. And this is the result one year later with tumor showing at least a 15-20% shrinkage in size. Now, these are not cases which I would advise uh, to get into on a regular basis. Uh, we all know that microsurgery is the procedure of choice for most of these cases. Uh, but sometimes patient choice is a strong determinant of the choice of treatment. So finally, I will like to show you a few examples of uh, one example of cavitary radio surgery. So this is an example of a lung CA, large one with ataxia. And this is, uh, I did surgery on this patient, the, the post-op scan on the right side, post-op one month scan, at which time we did cavitary radio surgery which is the recommended treatment these days rather than subjecting these patients to a whole brain radiation therapy. And this is four months post CyberKnife showing that there is no enhancement at all in the tumor resection bed. And this patient does not need any whole brain radiation therapy. We can wait for in case there is any tumor progression. So basically, the important issue with radio surgery is we have to be very cautious in choosing patients for radio surgery. Uh, any patient who needs decompression, like, for example, a pituitary adenoma pressing on the optic chiasm is not a good indication. Anytime you want a rapid response, radio surgery is not a good indication. Obviously, the lesion must be moderately sized, 3 centimeter or less in diameter. And we generally avoid uh, radio surgery in younger patients. So uh, this is a small video. I'm not sure if it will play. Yeah, so this is a small video showing the actual cyber knife procedure. And at the in parallel, you can see the main summary points in which basically what I wanted to say is that radio surgery is very, very similar to surgery in the philosophy and approach. Uh, and it is a very, very important adjunct for managing brain tumors. And it's backed by a long um, uh, sort of many, many decades of uh, experience, clinical experience and published literature, but really the good outcomes depend on appropriate case selection and good technique. Now in the video, you can see the patient has been positioned on the CyberKnife machine uh, with a high degree of accuracy. And uh, in this treatment, which only lasted 25 minutes for this young lady with a CP angle meningioma, and this is the machine delivering one of the 150 beams of radiation in the space of something like 25 minutes. And after which the patient is ready to go home and fully resume her normal activities. So with this, I'd like to end my presentation and uh, say that um, it's been a pleasure to be here with all of you virtually and look forward to being with you next time in person. Thank you. Thank you, sir. That was a very beautiful presentation. Now we'll move ahead since uh, we are running out of time. We'll take more questions. Our next presentation is about mechanical thrombectomy by Dr. Bipul Gupta. Hi, everybody. I think it's recorded. If you want to, I can take it live as well now. So, you know, at each stroke, the infarct core keeps expanding for many hours, and each minute we lose 2 million cells, and therefore, recanalization leads to better outcomes. 
IBTPA works, but only for small clots and only up to four and a half hours or so. Then the technique came of mechanical thrombectomy in which we take a microcatheter and deploy the stent and then inflate the balloon guiding catheter and take out the stent as well as the clot, which truly changed acute stroke management. And these are all the trials which came positive in 2015 and which showed that mechanical thrombectomy led to much better outcomes in acute stroke with major vessel occlusion. So what are the kind of patients we do it? The patient who is independent, has significant deficit, NHS is more than equal to six, small and medium size and fog, which was defined by aspects more than equal to six, six, major vessel occlusion, and initial guidance were up to procedure within six hours, but now we know we have really expanded this. I will talk about it further. TPA can be given, but we don't wait for it to work. You know, we give TPA, shift to the table, we puncture, and we go at it. The arteries open up well and good. We don't do it, but otherwise we go at it. Timing is critical in this patient. So these were the diffuse and dawn trials, diffuse up to 16 hours and dawn up to 24 hours. They showed that mechanical thermite may remain useful, very uh, much better outcomes. If the impact is small, deficit is there, even at delayed hours, it was very effective method. And this is not part of the guidelines now, up to 16 to 24 hours of acute stroke. This is a typical case, do it small and fast in the left middle septal artery territory. We can see there is ICA occlusion, uh, uh, in the CT angiogram, and this is how a typically a case would happen. Yeah, so in the angiogram showing there is IC occlusion, and we are crossing the occlusion blindly with the micro guide wire, which is usually not so difficult to do so. We do micro catheter injection here, and then we are deploying this stent from this level. And after deploying it for a little bit, you know, maybe from this point of time, we push it out, we push out the stand, which is called as push and fluff technique. It helps to expand the stand completely and it sinks into the clot. And after that, we have taken one injection, which will show that yes, the artery is now partly open here in this area. And then we inflate the balloon guiding and take out the stent along with the clot. And now the angiogram shows complete retinalization. There is some spasm of the middle cerebral artery here, but uh, you know it usually resolves. And this is the stent uh, with the clot uh, sitting there, small infarct here, and patient made a complete recovery. Now, how do we improve our outcomes? The key is time. And of course, the second part is the technique, which is important. So let me talk about the technique first. So what do we want to achieve in mechanical thromatomy? We want to achieve complete recanalization 2B3. Tiki 2B3 means almost complete recanalization, filling up all the distal vessels. It's not enough to have some flow in the AMC and you think the rest will work out. So what, what does it help? As I've already shown you, using balloon guiding catheter when using stent retriever really helps. Long stents have shown that they are better because they cover the clot completely. You don't have to really place it very finely and doesn't harm to use a long stent. And I mentioned push and fluff technique, you push out the stent and we do aspiration when we're taking it out with the balloon guiding inflated so that we can suck out the clot as well. So these are the trials which showed that the much better outcomes were with the balloon guiding catheter. This is just to show a longer stent like this is better so as to we are covering the clot completely and push and fluff technique leads to better sinking. What I have seen, if the blue is the stent, when you push out the stent, it has sunk into the clot much better than when you just release it by, by uh, from the micro catheter. So this is uh, one case uh, with push and fluff technique, uh, uh, wake up stroke, 65 year old female, middle cerebral artery occluded, huge hypoperfusion. And one can see here, MC is occluded, micro catheter injection, so in digital vessel, this is the stent. You can see it's completely expanded stent here because we have pushed it out, it's sunk into the clot. You take out the clot and then uh, and then you can see complete recanalization here. There are different techniques. One is adapt technique. So what we realize, uh, people have realized that you can just take a wide bore catheters nowadays are available, which are called as aspiration catheters. You can take them in and just aspirate out the clot. Particularly, this is useful when you cannot place a balloon guiding placement. This is in posture circulation. And when there is fibrin rich clot, because fibrin rich is hard clot and the stent retriever will not sink into it. Uh, this is one of the patients, uh, right municipal artery occlusion, was a delayed stroke 11 hours, great collaterals. And we have used just an aspiration catheter here and led to complete recanalization. And this patient made a complete recovery in spite of the delayed thrombectomy. Another patient, basal artery occlusion. A young lady had infarcts in the brainstem, but a lot of brainstem still preserved. 
we decided to go ahead. You can see a large clot in the basilar here. And this is the aspiration catheter. As you can see, a large clot has come out. So first circulation, a lot of times, the first probe we use is just aspiration. And this is the final angiogram. There is small embolism in the digital PC where there were great collaterals which didn't pursue it further. Another technique is combined technique. That means you're using a like a guiding catheter here or a balloon guiding possible aspiration catheter as well as standard retriever, which is known as Salumra technique. And, uh, uh, and some, there are various names to it uh, as well. So this technique, when do we use it? Um, so when this tortuous anatomy, we know balloon guiding cannot be placed or we have failed in simple strand retriever, then we use this combined technique. This patient was 92 year old, middle cerebral artery occlusion, and extremely tortuous anatomy, balloon guiding wouldn't go. And, and the aspiration is not great when there are such loops uh, in the ICA in the neck as well. Here you can see angiogram shows MC occlusion. And here you can see how your aspiration catheter has gone digitally. You can see it now. So no other aspiration balloon guiding wouldn't have worked here. So we've taken the digital aspiration catheter and then deployed this. This is the aspiration catheter. This is the strand retriever, which is deployed there. And then we do suction from the guiding as well as this aspiration catheter and take out the clot and we get a complete occlusion. This old man made a complete recovery. Another part which I talked about was the time. Now, even way before, and this is old article 2009, what people realize is that the results really go down as the time passes by. So that means for every 30 minutes uh, uh, delay, and uh, there's a 10% less chance. And believe me, you know, 30 minutes sounds a lot, but it's very difficult at time to recognize these cases. So what we, we talk about, we do in our unit is parallel processing. That means it's not that uh, intervention uh, imaging is done, clinical is done, then imaging, then intervention, then intraarterial therapy decision, then the team gets activated, and then we activate the lab. No, you have to do parallel processing. That means when you're doing clinical evaluation, that time the intervention is already on call. While the imaging is happening, the intraarterial decision is taken, all the teams are activated at the same time, and then straight away patient goes to the angiography suite. So we call it parallel processing. This we try a lot. That means we don't wait for somebody to see and talk, call us. When acute stroke code goes, we are already activated and we go ahead with it. One second. All right. So what, what we have done that there is no dress change. There is no valuable transfer. We don't, we just get a cannula and there's no consent for CT. There is no waiting list for K, no waiting for KFT. We just go ahead. Our team is alerted at the first go in the emergency. So we are already ready with it. And directly to CT, CT stroke protocol, we do, we do CT, CTA, and then in our department, we do a quick DWI. And clinical assessment done on the imaging, and then we straight away shift from the CT scan to the cath lab where already we are ready. So, and financially, we, as long as patient commits, we just go ahead with the procedure. We don't really wait for them to deposit money and consent is pre written. So, this is how our lab is organized at RTMS from emergency department. Patient goes to CT scan MRI and straight away down the corridor is DSA lab. So that it is very quick. Even TPA has to be given at times, given in the DSA, and then we take it on the table. If patient is improved, well and good, otherwise we'll puncture and go ahead. And BLEAM is quite safe to puncture TPA. Single wall puncture, we have done it, and we place a closure device in all our TPA patients. Surprisingly, we have never even had a single case of groin hematoma of all the thromectomy we have done after TPA. How fast can we do? This patient was a doctor, 71-year-old female, onset as 1 p.m. In peripheral hospital imaging was done, small infarct seen on the right side, and, and a complete IC occlusion. This patient was, uh, uh, her son was a neurointerventionist, so he was in touch with us. So very quickly, they administered TPA and transferred to Artemis, and we were ready for this. And this is how ideally should happen for all patients. 440 patient comes in, we punctured at 450, IC occlusion, we place a balloon guiding, cross it, Stand retriever and we tip and with flow rest, we take out the clot and it's complete recanalization of 506. 30 minutes from the from the patient reaching the emergency door, we had completely recanalized. And this is how it should be in most of these cases. If there's a pre-intimation, small infarct on the post up and patient did very well. Ideally, all of us subscribe to the system like this. The last I'm going to talk about is the tandem occlusions. How do we do it? What is tandem occlusion? When there is atherosclerotic stenosis at the origin included, and there is a distal clot as well. This is what we call as tandem occlusion. Just simple clot in the IC, we call, we call it tandem occlusion. So this can be challenging at times. So do we do the stenosis first or the clot first? 
what we do is we usually cross it with the uh, with the micro guide bar. Thank you. Uh, now I would like to call upon Dr. Bal Gopal. Uh, he is going to talk about percutaneous screw fixation. Afternoon. So I'll be talking on uh, percutaneous screw fixation. So, as you know, the uh, in open conventional spine surgery, so it we usually make a large incision with extensive subperistial dissection of the muscles from one transverse process to the another, with extensive muscle dissection and with large blood volume loss. It leads to also lengthy hospital stay, and sometimes we have difficulty to get from lateral to medial angulation for a good process on the pedicle screws. Uh, however, in the percutaneous pedicle screw, so the pedicle is accessed through a small incision rather than large incision. And it has several advantages, like there is no need for uh, doing paraspinal muscle dissection. It reduces the chances of muscle atrophy and blood loss and postoperative back pain. And then it reduces the operative time also. So, however, there are some uh, drawbacks like increased radiation, cost, availability, and learning curve. So, the outline of the talk will be pedicle screw, percutaneous pedicle screw, indications and contraindications, and technique. So, as we know, the uh, pedicle screw, a pedicle consists of the dense cortical and cancellous uh, bone which connects the vertebral body with the posterior elements. And then in percutaneous pedicle screw fixation, the pedicle screw is placed through a small incision. We dilate the muscles rather than do the subperistial dissection. And we use the extenders to place the screw. And contour doors are passed subfacially. So the indications are uh, the compression fracture with on instability, burst fractures, osteoporotic fractures and degeneration like listasis or discogenic back pain. There are some caveats in percutaneous uh, pedicle screw. Uh, sometimes uh, if the patient needs decompression, we might go into open surgery rather than percutaneous. Uh, we cannot do fusion in these cases. And uh, sometimes it's difficult without navigation to do the multiple level fixation. So steps. They usually the it's uh, general endotracheal intubation is used because sometimes it can initially it can take long time so we must be uh, aware of the pressure points and keep the abdomen free. Uh, entry is mainly based on the strict AP X-ray. We mark the medial and lateral borders of the pedicle in strict AP view. Target entry point is three o'clock or nine o'clock. And we use the gym CD needle to access the pedicle screw. So the trajectory is lateral to medial. Uh, Preoperative planning in the CT scan console is very, very important to know about the diameter 